now please go ahead So, sir, we are live now. Go ahead. Okay. So, a very good afternoon, everyone. I am Santosh Parasar here from SOCHEM. I very warmly welcome all of you to SOCHEM Virtual XVRL Conference 2021. The conference is supported by ACIL Group, Smart Bharat, Bombay Stock Exchange Investor Protection Fund, SMC Group, Renew Power Technology Partner is Devtel Electrosoft Private Limited. And software partner is MicroVista. The objective of this conference is to discuss and deliberate on the emerging areas of application of XBRL, educating the users and professionals, promoting its application, and to address the problems and questions of the stakeholders. Through this conference, SOCM seeks to remove obstacles which otherwise likely to come if the global advancements happening to XBRL are not updated to those. Who actually apply in their respective organizations and thereby making an effort to sensitize them and to contribute for strengthening governance in the corporates, especially in India. Here is a small announcement that XVRL is a trademark of XVRL International and that all rights are reserved by XVRL International. The XVRL standards are open and freely licensed by XVRL International and as such, an XVRL conference is no way associated with XVRL International. We have with us Honorable. Uh, guest of Honor, Srimati Geeta Singh Rathor, Deputy Director General, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India. We have with us a special guest, CA Atul Kumar Gupta Ji, past president ICEI and member board of XBRL International. We have with us CA Dr. Ashok Haliya, Chairman, Association Task Force on Accounting Standards and former Secretary ICI and former MD and CEO of PTC India Financial Services Limited. We have eminent speaker, uh, Mr. Neeraj Kulsresha, Chief Regulatory Officer, Bombay Stock Exchange Limited. We welcome you, sir. We have with us Mr. Vijay Sasdeva, Co-Chairman, Association National Council for Corporate Affairs, Company Law and Corporate Governance, and Deputy National Leader North, Risk Advisory Services of Haribakti and uh, Company. We are also joined by uh, a special guest, Mr. Mike Willis, his Associate Director from uh, SEC, Securities Exchange Commission USA, former chairman XBR International. We shall be joined by very, very eminent speakers from the corporate as well. Uh, we will be joined by Mr. Vijay Sahani, Director of Bapta Electrosoft Private Limited, Mr. Binod Kashyap, Indian national expert at ISO TC 295 Audit Data Services and founder NextGen. We will be having speakers, international speaker, Mr. Eric E. Cohen, he is co-founder of XBRL and father of XBRL GL, proprietor Cohen Computer Consulting. We will be having Dr. Rajan Prasad, ex-EY professor, ex-EY uh, director EY, Center for Auditing and Research on Advanced Technologies. We will be joined by Ms. Liv Watson, Senior Advisor and Digitization Lead at Impact Management Project and former of Senior Director, Work Visa USA. Mr. Malav Dalwadi, Founder and Director Microbista Technologies will be joined by uh, us uh, in uh, the technical session. A small announcement is here that uh, Dr. David uh, Blaswowski, Head Data Governance and uh, you know Regulatory Affairs, Helios Data and former Senior Policy Advisors, could not make to join us uh, due to some unavoidable personal reasons, and he will be joining in our uh, next on request uh, our you know different uh, another program. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is truly an international one. As each eminent speaker, both international and international, invited in this conference has treasury of knowledge, expertise in the subject, which is unmatched and truly international one. I may invite all the participants to fasten your seat belt as a conference offer, and I'm sure that you can't afford to miss any opportunity at this particular exclusive platform on this XVRL conference. I would like to invite Mr. Vijay Sasdeva, Co-Chairman, Association National Council for Corporate Affairs, Company Law and Corporate Governance, and Deputy National Leader North Risk Advisory Services, Harivakti and Company, to please come and uh, give your opening and welcome address. Over to you, Mr. Vijay Sasdeva, sir. I welcome you, sir. Mr. Vijay Sasdeva. Uh, 
thank you santosh and also thank you for giving us experience of a virtual aircraft in today's time where travels are still not so common so you have reminded us to pass on our seat belts uh, so uh, with this a very good afternoon and warm welcome to all of you to ashocham webinar on international xbrl conference 2021 emerging trends and opportunities as santosh highlighted that this is truly a, a international uh, webinar we have a lot of emerging speakers both from india and abroad as ashocham it is an honor for us to have such noble members in the inaugural session and other technical sessions during the day let me extend warm welcome to all of you also on behalf of ms preeti malhotra chairperson ashocham national council for corporate affairs company law and corporate governance and also the chairman of smart bharat group dear participants we have honored presence of our guest of honor today uh, ms uh, shrimati geeta singh rathor uh, we extend our warm welcome to ca atul kumar gupta mr neeraj kulshesh ca dr ashok haldia uh, our friend and mentor shri uh, sc agarwal sir and also let me uh, welcome uh, mr mike who has joined us and the hard efforts put in by mr vinod kashyap our friend for putting up this event together on the opening address for this uh, event today let me share that xbrl is a freely available and global framework of for exchanging business information since its implementation in the year 2011 india has now gained a decade of experience in xbrl and expanded the users both in the private and public corporate sector as well as regulators and the government ashocham highly promotes such technological developments which are significant in initiatives to promote corporate governance effective regulations and leading best practices the standardized data recording storing transmitting and reporting of business financial and non financial information with xbrl has proved to be far economical faster safer and highly effective which is a key component towards trans uh, transparent governance mechanism xbrl allows the expression of semantic meaning commonly required in business reporting the language is xml based and uses the xml uh, syntax and related xml technologies as the use of xbrl expands staying up to date with the xbrl framework and guidelines issued by various regulators in india uh, such as uh, ministry of corporate affairs securities exchange board of india department of direct and indirect taxes and also about the global advances in the is the key to increasing accuracy in xbrl filings as digitalization in business and industries is gaining gaining momentum it is important for corporate and governance stakeholders to understand the intricacies and implications of working in the xbrl environment which drives real time benefits that that are essential for transparent reporting and compliance towards governments moving back about the event today uh, dignitaries distinguished participants ladies and gentlemen we are pleased to share that this event is widely covered and attended we have more than we have around 1000 registrations for this event so we are uh, uh, seeing this event live with uh, nearly 1000 participants all over the country and the globe uh, the webinar today is scheduled from 2 pm to 7 pm and will comprise of an oral session from 2 to 3 pm two technical sessions from 3 pm to 5 pm and 5 pm to 7 pm respectively uh, including the uh, question and answer uh, sessions the webinar has leading experts and dignitaries on xbrl both from india and international so with this uh, i and priti malhotra once again extend a warm welcome to all the members and to all the participants for the event today back to you santosh thank you thank you vijay sir thank you sir thank you so much ladies uh, and gentlemen uh, i am sorry and apologize for uh, having you know missed to you know announce we have on our presence of sri sc agarwal ji also here in this conference you will be uh, concluding this inaugural session uh, and will propose a bit of thanks so i welcome you uh, uh, sc agarwal sir now i would like to request and invite uh, ca dr ashok haldia sir uh, chairman association task force on accounting standards and former secretary icai 
uh, he is also former MD and CEO PTC India Financial Services Limited. I welcome you, sir, uh, to enlighten with your address, sir. Over to you, Dr. Ashok Alia, sir. Dr. Ashok Haldia, sir, can you please hear us? Can you hear me? So I think uh, there is some uh, interruption. Vijay Sajdev, sir, with your permission, can I request uh, then to invite uh, nearest full stretch, sir, please? Uh, I think, yes, uh, Santosh. Yes, Santosh. Let's go ahead and we can request Mr. Yeah. Haldia to. So uh, now I uh, may I request uh, Mr. Neeraj Kulsrest, Chief Regulatory Officer, Bombay Stock Exchange Limited, to share your uh, perspectives of BSE. So I invite you and hand over to you, Mr. Neeraj Kulsrest, sir. Thank you, Santoshji. Uh, uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank Asocham for providing us this opportunity to speak at this event. Uh, XBRL has been at the core of our uh, heart for a very long time. So, in fact, we were one of the earliest adopters of XBRL. So, therefore, it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, it is fit that, you know, literally 10 years after, a decade after its introduction in India, at least, you know, we are having this uh, conference. So, I congratulate you for that. So, uh, broadly, our, the concept, if we were to look at from our perspective as stock exchanges, we have a uh, stock exchanges are about uh, data, information, uh, trading, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, while a lot of things are said, but our role, and which is what I am responsible for, is primarily as ensuring information asymmetry is removed because finally information is value, and our role primarily is to remove that asymmetry and to ensure every investor gets the same information at the earliest as soon as uh, disseminated by the company. Because, uh, because, because of the real-time nature of trading, any information, if someone has or someone does not have, can result in profits and losses, and which I'm sure I don't need to elaborate on. And therefore, it's it's a social response. It's a responsibility that is that that we take very seriously. In this direction, so I'll give you a perspective. What have what used to happen earlier, and why we decided to adopt this? What used to happen was companies used to report in certain their annual reports or whatever their various uh, disclosures which are required as per SEBI, and they would disclose. Someone would send by fax and all those kind of things, and then eventually it moved to some kind of a data format which was Excel. Etc. So all those things were going on, and then we realized that uh, the challenge is that how do you make a vast data available? There is a lot of research which is going on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then came this particular language tool, which is uh, which we are using open source because we are a, actually one of the earliest adopters of open source technologies also, and we decided to adopt this. And with this adoption. Uh, our attempt has been to ensure that most of the filings now gradually of corporates and even of our stockbrokers moves to the XBRL form, which will include uh, primarily com companies quarterly companies results, quarterly half annual results, results, and various other disclosures which the companies are required to make. And in this direction, yes. for example, the IndIIS reporting or reporting relating to banks and the NBFCs, etc. So, where there are various multiple reportings, and the from SEBI's regulatory perspective, non-reporting carries a penalty. Now, the second piece was that if while we can decide on adopting any technology, any new technology like XBRL also required us to ensure how do we make it easy for adoption. So with that question in mind, 
in fact our adoption has been a very unique uh, framework now if you were to put it differently for example when we file the income tax returns what do we do we just go fill out some forms etc then convert it into a file and that file is what you submit to the income tax authorities and so we worked with that concept and in fact our ceo since he was also responsible for the income tax related site related work at that time filings work along with the government so we decided to adopt the same framework so we have created simple excel formats which the corporates need to fill in and then that data we have provided tools within that excel so as and that is pre validated everything is validated right there so companies don't need to just need to fill in the details it's as simple as that and then just run a tool it converts it into xbrl and that that's the that is as easy to report with this we have been uh, we have seen heartening in information sharing now so while when we started in 2015 probably there were only around 3000 adopters and which increased to 42000 and then uh, way now last year i mean current 1920 last year when the reporting statistics it's around a lakh so that's the kind of different kinds of reportings which are taking place right from 3000 to uh, 100000 over a 5 year time frame so it is a very very important thing and it is uh, one of the best pieces is that because of this it is th this kind of a framework x why xbrl because it results in the framework itself provides a lot of validations yes there is a lot of hard work involved which we need which we as uh, quasi regulators need to do which is to create the taxonomy so that's the real effort but we do all that so for a user we make it very simple and our suggestion to anyone who wants to adopt it is to follow a similar model that if you want a widespread adoption ensure that technology because see technology one of the biggest uh, aspects of technology is how do you disperse the technology how do you make it very widely available if it is not easy and simple to use it cannot be then widely adopted and that's what is our mantra and with this now for example i'll give you another example which is we have something called the corporate announcement filing system which we call caf so a company which has to file information they have direct access to the system so earlier what used to happen the company would provide the information and then it would be there would be a some lag of a few minutes where it will then go to our website now this is the value part i was trying to talk about now the company as soon as it files it presses enter the company's person it is immediately uploaded on our website and that is one of the reasons why bsc website today for corporate information relating to results or any other information about corporates is one of the most popular sites in the country with uh, with a hit of around uh, 1 million 10 million uh, users on an average I, i'm sorry 1 million users on an average per day so there are several benefits and i would just like to to say that you know use of technology uh, as i have already mentioned finally to make it simple is the is the way to move forward to ensure that finally the aim of uh, information asymmetry is achieved and all investors and all participants and all stakeholders get the same information at the same time i would just like to stop here so i thank you once again for providing me this opportunity to speak and uh, uh, thank you very much thank you thank you so much sir uh, neeraj full special sir for lighting your uh, bsc's perspective especially in the context of the subject tax prl and i hope uh, this will make uh, ease to understand for the stakeholders participating here especially those who are in the listed companies segment so now i would like to take the opportunity of inviting uh, dr ashok halia sir uh, so please uh, uh, over to you sir uh, thank you sir thank you santosh these are the hazards that we face when we interface with the technology and hopefully as we advance the technology we overcome this hazard the opportunity that is given by the covid 19 uh, mrs geeta singh rathod the deputy director general uh, ministry of corporate affairs uh, mr atul gupta the past president of the icai and a board member of xbrl international mr mike willis the associate director of securities exchange commission us mr neeraj kulshreshta chief regulatory officer uh, bsc and uh, mr sc agrawal the cmd of 
SMC Global Securities Limited, and yes, Mr. Vijay Sasdeva. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy that uh, this conference is on a very important topic of, uh, on, of XPRL, Emerging Trend and Opportunities. It gives us an occasion to take stock of what has taken place so far in the growth and development of XPRL in India and globally, and also then discuss the emerging trend and opportunities, how we can really make it as a national and a global to the comfort and ease of the users and other participants. I'm very happy to be associated with this conference with one more reason. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, when I was part of the process or the team of initiating the introduction of the concept and the practice of XPRL in India, involved in, as, a, as a secretary of the ICI, involved in discussions with the MCA, RBI, IRDA, and other regulators, and also then in setting up of XPRL India. Since then, we have, we have moved a great deal forward in the growth and development of XBRL. XBRL is not a new concept now. There are no ifs and buts. It's accepted in India. It's accepted globally. Over 100 countries, including China, Korea, Japan, and USA, are using XBRL. In India, as Mr. Kulshirista said, the RBI requires the bank filing uh, their reports using the XPRL format, the MCA and the SEBI requiring the companies to make compliance filing on the XPRL. These are the regulators who require, but more than that, the beneficiaries are the users of the XPRL reporting, the analysts, the credit risk agencies, the investors, and the regulators. Uh, therefore, the success of the XPR mechanism lies in as to how effectively this interface between the XPR platform, the users, and the interface does take place through the XPR platform, and how ease and the comfort the users of the, in, the, the data available on the XPRL is for the for the credit analysts, the uh, the uh, the risk managers, the investors, the regulators, and therefore, I believe this conference should address as those aspects to really make an XPRL a national uh, national standard. Now, XPRL to me, the regulators have a lot of advantages. They are able to they use it's a unique, it's a common format, and that being a common format. They, are, they can take the money, the usage of the funds, they can take the assets ownership, and the, the role of the regulators then shifts from policing to the preventing. And that's very, very important aspect of functioning of any regulator. Having said that, there are certain issues in the next couple of minutes. I believe those needs to be addressed. One, is the, is the XPRL a national data reporting standard? Certainly not. I believe all the regulators and the government authorities should come together and see that the XPRL becomes a national data reporting standard. The another, the, the, uh, the second point is the extending XPRL to all entities by the RBI, irrespective of the nature and the size of the entities in votes. And the third thing to review and take stock as to, to what extent and how effectively the data available on the XPRL platforms are being used by the regulators in terms of data analysis, data analytics. For example, is the XBRL platform being used for fraud detection? To my knowledge, my understanding, not. And that's a great advantage of an XPRL platform that it can help in preventing and detecting uh, the uh, the uh, the fraud. I mean, this is just one example of a potential use which the regulators needs to needs to explore. But in certainly, they need to see as to what extent they have been able to use, and what more they can do, and what is that that is required to increase the uh, the uses of the XBRL platform. Then there are challenges. My interaction uh, within the industry and outside. 
there are challenges with the companies in filing in the XBRL format. One might say those are tribal challenges, those are tribal uh, uh, difficulties and challenges, but then there are problems exist. There are challenges and difficulties for the users of the financial reporting, investors, the credit analysts, the risk managers, and so on and so forth, in tracking, in, 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 in retrieving the information, in using it in a manner that is helpful in data analysis and data analytics. Remember, there is a huge investment of the government and the regulators that has gone into XPRL platform. And more than that, it is the companies who put the additional effort, the additional invest, investment in reporting on the XPRL format. So the challenge is to really to make the XPRL as national data reporting standard and then see how best and how effectively that can be used. We also need to be sure that there is often a, 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 the blockchain technology is, is something that should help in, 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 in promoting and extending the use of XBRL. It is often believed, and I would say it's a myth that the, uh, that the block uh, Chain technology, blockchain technology would replace the XBRL. XBRL is 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 a is a is a is a data standard, and the blockchain is the distributed ledgers. So the so the XBRL is not a distributed uh, ledger system, and blockchain technology is not a data report uh, data reporting standard, and therefore. And if the blockchain technology for a, has to be successful, it has to integrate and depend on the on the XBRL. For example, the the, the smart contracts requires reliable and consistent data, and that reliable and consistent data can be provided by a platform like XBRL. So I believe XBRL for a, I, I, I recall those days of late 90s and early 2001 when we used to make a lot of effort in convincing, uh, the, uh, convincing the authorities and different stakeholders in the benefits and the efficacy of the XPRL, considering the investment involved and the technology available. We have passed through that stage. It is no more uh, if and but and why and how. It is a reality. The, the challenge for all of us is to how to make, how to how to make the effective use of the XBRL technology, XBRL platform, and then make the, 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 the cost of filing economical, easier, comfortable, as well as the accessibility of the information for the users at ease. With that, I hope with the distinguished panel that we have uh, in, the, uh, in the inaugural session and also later on, in the technical sessions would certainly um, uh, enrich us about what needs to be done in the, uh, to make the XPRL really an efficacious and efficient standard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashok Ghatia, sir. Uh, uh, we can understand that you are the pioneer uh, when this even XVRL was being introduced uh, in uh, 2011. So you have been associating with this uh, subject uh, from since beginning. Now I have uh, pleasure of inviting uh, C. Uh, Atul Kumar Gupta ji, past president ICAI, uh, member board of Xperial International. So uh, I, I invite and welcome you, uh, Gupta sir. To make your special address, may I request Atul Gupta sir, sir please. Thank you, Santoji, and uh, Madam uh, Rita Rathorji, uh, the very distinguished personalities like uh, Ashok Aldiaji, S. C. Agarwal Saab, Mr. Mike, who is the former president of the XBRL International, Neeraj Kulsreshta Ji, other distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, the panel of speakers, and uh, the colleagues from the uh, ASOCHEM. Uh, at the outset, um, uh, pleased to be part of this uh, event and uh, uh, getting this opportunity to share some of our thoughts from the XBRL International vis-a-vis -vis the overall accountable and the transparent regime which we are working for. 
uh, friends, as you are aware that uh, when we are talking about the financial statements or the other disclosures uh, organization has to do, the ultimate purpose is to inculcate the transparency, accountability, and at the same time, as being rightly mentioned by our some of our colleagues, that uh, we have to see that the effective decision making is there, uh, as rightly pointed out by the Neeraj uh, Kulsare strategy. Now, friends, when we are looking for this all, ultimately we need some language, we need some, uh, uh, I will say, the standard wherein everybody will report. So, the rightly coined the word that uh, it should be treated as a national data reporting standard by Haldiaji, that uh, the XBRL is not actually a, a, a freely licensed software, but it is actually a freely licensed standard which try to create the uh, by using certain dictionary specs, tags or syntax, a uh, language, a grammar from where we can have the all these integrated kind of a reports which are we are looking for the purpose of accountability and transparency can be aimed for. Now, my dear friends, when we are looking for the organizations and with the perspective of the regulators, we are looking that it should be the value with the values. So it is not only that we have to do our financial uh, reporting wherein we are looking only for the values, but at times we are looking for the values as well. So when we are talking about the rightly pointed out by Haldiaji is about the fraud. Um, I take this to uh, a next level that let us uh, understand that when we are looking for a CSR reporting, when we are looking for a ESG, that is environment, social and governance reporting, and even for the corporate governance, we require the uh, reports in such a way that it is not only the machine readable, it is not only the human readable, but also by having that syntax and the tags available, it gives a comparative analysis and even the like a, the analysis of the entire reportings or the filings are being made by the various organizations. And to achieve that, the standard which is being developed by the XBRL International are actually provide these specifications that okay, how you can have the digital reporting and based on those specifications, the tags or the specs, the regulator has to create the dictionaries or the taxonomies by virtue of that they can set the rules of the game and based on that rules, the companies and the organizations are suppo supposed to be getting, uh, supposed to be the report, supposed to be reported on the various kind of a rules of the games which are being set through that grammar uh, specs or the text which are there in the XBRL International. So it is very, very important that we need to understand that there are the different stakeholders which are involved in the XBRL uh, reporting. One is the standard which are being laid down by the XBRL International, which are freely available. The uh, uh, regulators need to develop the taxonomies or the dictionaries to achieve the result they are looking for from this uh, freely licensed uh, standard which is available. And then we need to understand that the most important part, which is we are presently not like a, we are not achieving that is something that to analyze the data which are being filed. Uh, through the XBRL, which is actually the, I will say, the soul of the entire discussion should be. So it is the, something that I try to convey you that it is not the reporting which matters. It is the analysis of the data which matters that the actually the XBRL aim for. Now, my dear friend, if I move further on the next slide, that if you see that uh, the adoption of the XBRL uh, standard at the global level, there are a uh, uh, large number of uh, global jurisdictions are there as being mentioned by the other colleagues that more than 100 countries are using this. This diagram shared you that uh, the level of accept uh, implementation. So from the first level, first to 15 scale, the darker will be the more the implementation, the lighter will be the less of the implementation. And you can see that, uh, yes, we are already implemented the XBRL reporting as far as the MCA or the SEBI or the BSC uh, uh, or the RBI is concerned, but still we have to go a long way to analyze the data to see that or oh, this is getting applicable on each and every company. So even before that, that we are implementing this in the each and every company, we need to understand that how to utilize, how to analyze this data for the better decision making and see the various kind of a compliances. Started with the Haldiaji who mentioned about the fraud reporting, I take it that yes, even I attended the number of conferences at the XBRL international level that the there are number of jurisdictions which are 
completely analyzing the data as far as the CSR is concerned. And now the ESG, which is a need of the R, that uh, the uh, global level, it is being uh, mandated that the uh, ESG reporting will be using the XBRL standards. My dear friend, uh, the ultimately, uh, why this XBRL is there at all, as I mentioned you that uh, on the next slide, that we are all uh, uh, looking for the, uh, 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 I believe that we skipped the one slide, uh, Gazi. Yeah, the quality driven. So ultimately, each one of us is looking towards the uh, quality. So focus is on the uh, quality uh, uh, driven exercise that ultimately we should have that kind of a data which we are looking for. Uh, again, uh, we have just uh, skipping one slide, uh, Gazi. Go back to one slide, please. For the benefit of our uh, viewers, because in uh, yes, the, this is the slide I'm looking for that the ultimately uh, right uh, why the XBRL international or the XBRL is there that ultimately looking towards the quality driven and uh, the data. So we have to enhance the best practices. That's why the XBRL international even establish a best practicing board wherein we are looking that the, what kind of a data rules should be there which can provide a quality reporting in the digital age environment, including the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. The point is that that we have to see that the all the specifications which are more simpler, accessible and making a backward compatibility. So ultimately what we are looking for that when the companies are filing the data, it should be more simpler. It should be a machine readable artificial intelligence is inbuilt and that is something that should be used for the decision making for which the regulator has to see that how we have to take it forward. Now, my dear friend, as I mentioned you that uh, uh, taking the clue from the uh, 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 point of uh, point, which he discussed about the fraud reporting, as we are mentioning in the next slide piece, that we are looking that the XBRL data in, uh, in the various jurisdiction is going to be used not only for the purpose of the normal filing, but also for the ESG and the climate disclosure. There are the mandate which is being received in the European Union that uh, and even in the other jurisdiction that uh, there will be a mandatory digital filing for the ESG reporting. So example, you are aware that recently the BRSR is being introduced in the SEBI for the 1000 top listed companies. Likewise, uh, the uh, other uh, in the times to come, there will be a voluntary disclosure as well. So uh, can we move to the ESG in such a way uh, that we are filing, we are reporting in our XBRL environment wherein the data can be compared, it can be analyzed, it can, the better decision making can be there for the purpose. That's why it is mentioned that it is that taking the data not as a refined, is, uh, is not as a processed data, but even a granular data is being taken by the various central bank and the insurance regulator. I just happy to intimate you when the um, our honorable vice chairman of the committee was mentioning that uh, this uh, uh, is a machine readable. So I'm happy to intimate you that the XBRL International has moved uh, uh, further uh, that now we are we have introduced the concept of IXBRL, uh, which is yet to be adopted by the Indian jurisdiction, wherein the reports will not be machine readable, but it will be the human readable. So at the same time, the both the, uh, the HTML based tag reports can be read by the human uh, 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 with the uh, like a normal uh, and we can have a machine readable uh, as well. So uh, this will be a unique feature which is there in the IDXBRL and is already being adopted by the US, Europe and the Japan and the other jurisdictions are following the same. I just share you an example that in the next slide that how it is a machine readable or uh, it is a human readable bo at both at the same time. I request the next slide please. So if you will see that for example, uh, we have a, uh, I request Vikaji to move to the next slide, yes. So uh, this is our example when we have a, a financial statement where in the, uh, uh, please go back to the uh, uh, last slide, sir. Uh, yes, no, sir, you are going ahead. Uh, uh, you are moving ahead. I wish you go back two slides now. No, you are going ahead again. I believe my time is over though. That's why he's saying thank you very much. Uh, taking to the last slide. So uh, you go back to one. Yes. So in case we are looking for a consolidated statement of income as a schedule, uh, we have given the cost of sales. Now this 10,522, uh, which is certainly in rupees in millions. Uh, you can see that uh, if you will click on this because the tax are attached to this value in the annual report. So automatically on the right hand side, you will see that what is the cost of sales, the period, 
the fact value, the accuracy, the change from the last year to this year. Uh, what is the entity though? So we have a uh, LEI and then they have given a concept. So all these relevant information related to this particular field is available once you are implementing the IXVRL reporting. So it's a unique case when you can have a comparative analysis, you can have a lot of uh, other details available and that will be very, very useful for the regulator to understand the, the, uh, the way the company is behaving, whether it's uh, related to fraud, corporate governance, ESG, or the CSR. So, for example, you will click on CSR automatically. The last year figures, the, uh, the like, uh, will be available. Uh, it will be available that they, uh, whether, uh, for this period, which period this relates to, what is the percentage change from last year to this year, and all these details will be available. So, it's uh, something that we need to create a tag, and the data will be available. So, this is the finest way that when we can have the more and the effective decision making and the better reporting by using the new methodology of the IXBRL. So I request uh, uh, the Vikasji to, you may go to the now, uh, uh, next slide as well. Uh, so similarly, uh, if you will see the next slide, uh, you will find that uh, uh, as uh, you can see, the inter-segment uh, elimish, uh, 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 eliminations are given that, okay, uh, on right-hand side, once you will click on a particular uh, uh, figure, uh, the data, you will get the complete details on the right hand side. So it's a machine readable as well as a, it's a human readable because it is attached that the tags are attached with the HTML uh, filing, which is there. Uh, uh, because you can move ahead uh, with the uh, another slide. I believe that we are already crossed the time limit as prescribed. Uh, so uh, you can move ahead as well. So the message which I wish to give you uh, from this entire deliberation. Uh, that uh, each one of us is uh, the purpose is clear that we are all working. I believe uh, because you can go to the last last slide only that the purpose as which we are all working is to improve the accountability and the transparency transparency in the business performance globally. And uh, by providing this kind of a open data exchange standard for the business reporting, I believe that uh, we are uh, moving in a right direction when uh, the uh, RBI, MC or CB, all who are taking the data on the XBRL, and I believe that will be moved to the IXBRL very soon, uh, will be having the that kind of a, uh, uh, data. Uh, the only point is that, that we need to inculcate the system where the one system will be speaking to another, meaning thereby there will be a national data reporting uh, standard. And then the data will be analyzed rather than like we are keeping the data, like we are taking the data, but we need to develop the uh, ecosystem to analyze the data and which can be used not only for the fraud reporting as uh, given by the Haldiaji, um, but also for the ESG, CSR, corporate governance, and even for the number of other purposes. Yes, now with the machine readable vis-a-vis -vis the human readable, the facilities which are inbuilt through the uh, in the XBRL be going beyond from the XBRL, XBRL, XML to the CSV as well. Uh, I believe that uh, will go a long way to support the entire regulatory and uh, decision making ecosystem. So with this, uh, I have the number of uh, other icons available that uh, anybody can uh, have the access to all the reports which are being getting generated. So in case somebody want to see online that, okay, how the specifications are working or what are the new developments are there uh, or even the how to uh, uh, new uh, uh, European, how the uh, filings are happening. That is all links are there in this uh, slide uh, show. Uh, so with this, thank you to SHM. Thanks to all my colleagues and especially uh, to Madam uh, for uh, giving uh, this opportunity. Man, she's uh, personally available, so it's a great moment that uh, because Madam is ultimately taking care of all this XVRL side. So uh, it's good to be uh, there with the in the presence of Madam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Atal Gupta, for uh, elaborating uh, comprehensively, covering the uh, you know um, uh, XVRL. And what is coming up is new, you know, IXBRL is now known to the uh, participants in India that uh, the new version of our XBRL is coming up. So uh, with this, thank you very much. And now I would like to take the opportunity and honor of inviting honorable uh, guest of honor, Madam Geeta Singh Dathur, Deputy Director General, uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India, to, uh, uh, to give your, you know, guest of honor address and bless us with your Remarks. So over to you, Madam Geeta Singh Rathorji. I welcome you, ma'am.
प्लीज अनम्यूट गीता मैम प्लीज अनम्यूट अशोक हल्दिया जी को चेयरमैन एसोच एम श्री विजय सचदेवा जी एस सी अग्रवाल जी नीरज कुल श्रेष्ठा जी अतुल कुमार गुप्ता जी इन्वाइटेड गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन गुड आफ्टरनून at the outset let me express my sincere appreciation for the honor i have been given and truly speaking i am really delighted to have this opportunity to address such an august gathering i would like to thank asuchem for the opportunity to say a few words at this international conference on xbrl 2021 emerging trends and opportunities information technology is evolving at a rapid pace bringing in paradigm shifts in how business is operate it has become more imperative in the financial reporting framework wherein business performance data is processed and stored in a structured format using standardized language indian economy is expanding at a rapid pace and the corporate sector has been a major growth driver in the progress there is an increased awareness of the relevance and economies of information Ministry of Corporate Affairs has been continuously working towards enabling an environment for smooth functioning of the corporate sector. Key elements of business performance are being captured through annual filings in MCA. Extensive extensible business reporting language or XPRL is a global initiative revolutionizing business reporting around the world. XPRL has emerged as a standard way of storing and transmitting business information globally. it ensures accuracy reliability timeliness and decision usefulness to various stakeholders it has proved to be a significant opportunity for various users of information and database the implementation of xbrl by the ministry has been a major step in integration of business reporting with global standards of data analysis ministry mandated certain class of companies to file their financial statements from 2011 onwards by using xbrl technology taxonomy the usage of tech and data technological platform in mca has improved the overall efficiency of the corporate sector xbrl has made reporting of financial statement easier and more accurate it has helped in achieving reduced cost and greater efficiency for the stakeholders as well as the regulators XBRL framework has supported systematic management of data. It has also pro pro provided uh, faster access to the data. Effective comparability of data has been a major value addition through the implementation, as it has ensured data consistency and integrity of the data. Leveraging machine readable tag data reporting. has made way for automated exchange of data with other regulators as well standardized reporting mechanism has helped in making effective and informed decisions hence enhancing the regulatory process ministry looks at xbrl as an effective and efficient tool in producing qualitative and quantitative information on business data mca will look forward to commonalities in taxonomy and data elements to the extent possible with other regulators in order to streamline the usage xbrl data bases can also be utilized in big data analysis in the coming future to ensure the success of xbrl as a new language of business reporting it is crucial that all stakeholders are fully aware of its usability and scalability multiple analysis and forecast can be made accurately if more entities are xbrl compliant an adequate database can help in preparedness in case of unfavorable trends building a strong knowledge base for the stakeholders can help them use xbrl as value added tool rather than a compliance burden i leave you with my best wishes I wish you all the success of this conference and continued advancement in your work and endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Geeta Singh Rathore ji, for.
for your uh, lightning kind words and gracing the occasion of this virtual webinar uh, virtual conference on XVRL. Thank you so much, madam. Now uh, I would like to request and invite uh, Sri S C Agarwal, Chairman and Managing Director of SNC Global Securities, to please uh, give the concluding remarks and vote of thanks. I invite you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Santos. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege for me to deliver vote of thanks and concluding remarks. I would like to be thankful to SOCM for this. XBRL is a language for electronic communication of business and financial data, which is revolutionizing business reporting around the world and offers major benefits to all those who create, transmit, use, analyze as such information. <coughs> XBRL is not just a language, but it is a technology that takes pieces of financial data with the aim of making the analysis and retrieval of data easier, quicker, and more most effective, cost effective. It has proved to be the standard way of recording, storing, and transmitting business financial information, regardless of what different countries they have different spoken languages throughout the world. The adoption of XBRL has resulted in major cost savings and gains in efficiency, improving processes in companies, governments, and other organizations. In fact, this is one of the factors which have added to ease of doing businesses, ease of complying to statutory and mandatory requirements, and also for ease of monitoring and supervising the reporting entry by regulators. There have been recent positive updates on further adding to ease of compliances in India as the National Stock Exchange has decided to accept the XBRL files for annual secretarial compliance reports which are submitted to Bombay Stock Exchange. The response from NSC was in alignment to SEBI circular, where in the listed entities are required to submit annual secretarial compliance report to the exchanges within 60 days of the end of the financial year as per the prescribed format. All, I, all listed companies have been called for submission of annual secretarial compliances report in XBRL mode only. I trust that the benefits of XBRL could be more and beyond the conventional data reporting and associated regulatory supervision and will provide a substantial value addition to the industry. I think this SOCM conference will bring out a lot more clarity about application of XBRL as well as international advancements which have been recently added towards strengthening the governance. I am sure that the contribution of SOCM National Council for Corporate Affairs, company law and corporate governance under the chairmanship of Ms. Priti Malhotra, Chairman Smart Bharat Group and Nodal Officer Mr. Santosh Prasar is doing excellent jobs towards alignment to mandates of regulators by educating and sensitizing all the corporate stakeholders from time to time on various subject matters. I would like to thank guest of honor Sri Mati Gita Singh Rathor, Deputy Director General, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India, for taking your this conference by your valuable address. You tell us the various uh, benefits of enhancing uh, this XBRL and mandating to various sectors uh, and the scalability and uh, talk about of usage analytical so uh, thank you very much for your address i am thankful to ca atul kumar gupta past president icai and member xbrl international for your special address and sir you talked about adoption of uh, ixbrl which is a next stage and uh, which can read human and machine uh, readable data so that is very important. I think uh, it is a next uh, improvement of XBRL and people and countries will adopt it, should adopt it, because it will be in both way of reading the information. So that is very good. I extend thanks to Mr. Neeraj Kulsred, Chief Regulatory Officer, BSC Limited, for sharing the perspective of BSC on the subject. Uh, uh, Mr. Neeraj Kulsred, 
you have very well explained you are the leader in implementing it and your website is very popular people uh, all all analysts and uh, um, users take benefit from your website and uh, visit your website very frequently that is excellent sir i also extend thanks to ce dr ashok kaldia and mr vijay sasdeva for your kind support throughout in organizing this conference which is at most important subject in recent times uh, mr ashok kaldia uh, talked about uh, difference in blockchain and xbrl they are uh, supplementary to each other not complementary and uh, whereas xbrl Uh, is a reporting statements and gives information through electronic way and uh, uh, blockchain is a technology distributed general uh, technology distributed ledger technology so both are complementary uh, not both should be uses <laughs> i also thank uh, mr uh, mike wills associate director security exchange commission usa former chairman xbrl international who will be the speaker in the next session technical session 2 but he has been associated since inaugural thank you very much for here and i think this your baby since you are you are involved uh, with the implementation of it right from the beginning i also extend thanks to all national international speakers who will join the technical session to make it a success i also extend thanks to all participants sponsors and partners of this conference including bsc investor production fund smart bharat group smc global renewable power tcil webtel electrosoft and microvista once again thank you all all the speakers and now i conclude here with over to mr santosh thank you very much thank you sc agarwal sir for uh, your kind words and concluding uh, the inaugural session and proposing vote of thanks thank you so much now uh, ladies and gentlemen we have pleasure uh, of moving forward towards technical session i can uh, I, i can have uh, you know pleasure presence of uh, mr mike willis i can see so uh, with uh, my special request uh, mr willis uh, so there was slight change in the schedule as per uh, request of vinod uh, kashyap sir so i accordingly aligned uh, to you know uh, meet the time uh, time zones requirements but however uh, since your presence is there i would request uh, uh, humbly request that uh, if you may please uh, take up the first session uh, on your topic so if it, is it okay mr mike will sir thank you that's fine thank you so uh, mr will is will Uh, Mr. Willis will take uh, uh, the session on digital reporting insights and consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's have welcome presence. Uh, welcome uh, to him. He is the associate uh, director of US SEC and former chairman XBRL. So I hand over to you, Mr. Mike Willis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, will somebody actually be presenting my slides for me here? Yes. Great. Thank you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts today. Um, there'll be a deck coming up in just a second. Um, again, I'm Mike Willis, the Associate Director uh, at the SEC. Um, we'll go on to slide three, which is the disclaimer. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission disclaims responsibility for any private publication or statement of any employee of or commissioner. This presentation expresses my views and does not necessarily reflect those of the commission. Uh, the commissioners or other members of the staff. So that's the standard disclaimer. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the discussion topics. The next slide. Uh, today, I'll share an overview of the SEC structured data uh, program, the value realized by preparers, by investors, by analysts, by regulators, and by other market participants. Uh, but before I get into the SEC's program, let's first talk about why. Why, why structured disclosure? Well, why do analysts demand and also use a structured disclosure when previously they received the information on the company website uh, from data aggregators, the re why not just get it there, get it from the company website? Well, in short, time is money, and it pays to understand what the company reports rather than relying upon a third party. So here is an example of the Amazon report. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we have what the company reported. This is their, their report, their annual report. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have what the data aggregator 
a one data aggregator, said the company reported. Now, any number that has a red box around it is different. So on the company side, we see that there's 19 rows of which nine have red boxes. So 10 they got right. So roughly they got it right 50% of the time. But additionally on the data aggregator side, there are five disclosures that the data aggregator says the company reported when in fact they did not. So this is an example of the amount of distortion and modification that's occurring, normalization some might say, uh, within the supply chain. And what our analysts actually interested in is what the company reported, not what some third party suggested they reported. And next slide, please. Now, one of the reasons for XBRL is actually to enable enhanced consumption. And so the question is, who consumes the data? Who's using it? You know, how would you describe the user? Are they old? Are they young? Um, are they analysts? Are they academics? Well, the short answer is about 90% of the users, a little over 90%, are actually machines, not human beings at all. And we can tell this by looking at the log files. A human being is not likely to download a thousand reports in a minute, but a machine is. And so we can tell that of over 90% of the users of this data, the initial users, are actually machines. Uh, and that makes some sense because it's a high speed processing environment. Again, we're back to the idea that time is money. Uh, so I'll speak up a little bit here. Um, so moving on to the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about inline XBRL. Um, this is a freely available international open standard that combines the human readable HTML, which is on the right here, with the machine readable XBRL on the left. Uh, and so when you put those two together, what you see as a human is the HTML, what the machine sees is what's in the background, the XBRL. And so inline XBRL provides what amounts to a augmented reality platform for the user to see things that are beyond what they've seen before. Uh, go to the next slide. So one of the things inline provides you is you can navigate through sections of the filing. On the left-hand pane here, you see lots of different sections very quickly navigate. So do you need a table of contents? Maybe not. You can just use the sections that are in the report. Um, for data points, how do you tell if a data structure is tagged? Well, anything with the box around it tells you that it's tagged. With inline, you also get granular information about each data element. In this example, we're showing you the FASB standards in the codification. So click on a, a number and it will actually point you directly to the codification or to the bound volume if it's an IFRS report. So this is some, some of the examples, but I've got some more. Next slide, please. Inline also allows you to narrow down your search. If you just type in revenue in the search bar, you get 95 facts. In other words, there are 95 data points that are directly related to revenue in this sample report, which happens to be United Airlines. So it also helps you do lots of additional things. Next slide. If you turn on the references function, where you hit settings and you check all boxes under reference, and then type in FASB and 606, which is the revenue accounting topic, now you get 77 facts and navigate through which facts are related to that specific accounting topic. This allows users, whether it's a preparer, the auditor, or someone else to determine if disclosures are matched with their appropriate accounting standards. So for example, if I was looking for stock compensation, most people would look for those words, but using the reference section, the reference search here, we can actually leverage the metadata to specifically identify all structured disclosures in a report even if those words, those specific words are not used. This is the idea of the semantics. We'll move on to the next slide. Inline XBRL offers other useful features. For example, you can sort all the data by period or by scale, like which amounts are in millions or in billions. So this allows you to very quickly go through the report and find the information that might be of interest to you, but also to discover additional disclosures that you may not have been previously aware of. Next slide. So speaking of that idea, you can also do benchmarking. Now, this is a feature that's available to the SEC staff. It's also available in some commercial products, 
but it's not available in the Edgar inline uh, open source inline app uh, viewer. So the inline XBRL viewer that's in Edgar doesn't have this function, but we also have put that in the staff version that the staff are using. So this is a benchmarking idea, and this is occurring directly on top of the report. This is what I meant by augmented reality. I can click on any number in the report and up pops a benchmarking summary of the company in question, the report in question, and I can select their peers and then see the peer information directly on top of the report. It's a little box that pops up. Now it includes a time series chart. Next slide. Uh, we can also go back and see the revenue, not only for the period that's being reported in the case of United, the annual report, we can also see the quarterly results that are reflected in this example. So you can see the information that's occurring here, but you also can see the impact of COVID and the travel restrictions on their revenue stream. That shows up very clearly on this slide, just as an example. Next slide. Now, this is another example of why the structured disclosure is very beneficial. Uh, with some filers, they might report research and development expense on the income statement. Other filers might put it in a footnote. So you're into kind of a, a treasure hunt activity if you're looking for research and development expenses. But with XBRL, because it's machine readable, it's not a treasure hunt anymore. It's a mouse click. So this listing of research and development expenses was something that I generated in less than 10 seconds by simply asking for the return of the research development elements that have been tagged across all registrants. Um, doesn't make any difference where it's presented, just that they've tagged it as research and development. So I list here the top 20 that popped up because the list of them all would be too many, but you get the idea. You very simply can aggregate all the data across all registrants. And that's not true just of numeric data, that works for narrative data as well, narrative disclosures. Moving to the next slide. So here's an example of how structured disclosure is useful. You can compare company filings across industries and periods. Now, as you may know, many filers have experienced material accounting and operational changes due to COVID. So one potential area for review is what filers reported uh, goodwill impairment charges that are related to COVID. So this is a list of periodic filings submitted in 2020 as of late December with a gap standard tag where unusual or infrequent item access further characterized with COVID related to the goodwill impairment. For those of you not familiar with the term gap standard tag, let me give you some background. Financial Accounting Standards Board developed standard tags for financial statement disclosures based on required accounting standards for all of the U.S. domestic filers, often referred to as gap filers. There's over 15,000 GAAP standard tags, and filers are required to use the standard tags for their disclosures. The standard tags allows us to easily extract and compare the data. So I've hidden some columns here, but the list also showed where the filer disclosed the COVID disclosures, a footnote or in the primary financial statements, the filer's industry, their size, the specific period, the amount was reported, et cetera. This is possible because the filers are using that standard tag. You can see it's very easy to do a benchmark or spot any outliers with the structured data. If all filers in a given industry included effects of COVID in their filings, any filer in that same industry that doesn't include any effect would stand out. So this is a very powerful review capability for the SEC staff as they're looking at reports to very quickly with a mouse click, identify where things are, who has the disclosure, and more importantly, who does not. Next slide. Here's a summary of some of the benefits of structured disclosure. Now, it's both human and machine readable, and that enables sort of that augmented reality idea I mentioned earlier. So, as a result, the SEC staff now enjoys a range of capabilities and features in what we call the open source inline XBRL viewer. So that's what's in Edgar. We've modified that for staff use. And here's a listing of some of the capabilities and features that the SEC staff enjoy. As I showed you just a minute ago, you can aggregate specific disclosures with a query. That's the R&D example. Literally a mouse click and you have that. But that would also show you tax and OL carry forwards for a market or a single segment, which is very important to identify liquidity opportunities as a result of the recent COVID 
oriented tax modifications, which allowed companies to carry back their NOLs. In other words, unlocking prior tax payments as a source of liquidity. You can also view a trending analysis like I showed you a chart, click on a number and see the trend. That also works for benchmarking. Not only can you can see the company's trend, but you can pick peers and see their trends as well. Additionally, there's a disclosure checklist that allows you to identify all required disclosures and conversely to identify the required disclosures that might be missing. Think about that for a second. That is incredibly powerful. So not only for the analyst at the SEC, but that's also useful for a preparer that's trying to figure out, have I got all my disclosures in the report? Additionally, there's filters for company specific disclosures and also a range of data quality errors. These provide useful flags for potential process and control concerns. In other words, if I'm mistagging something, I can see that very quickly by looking at these filters and those are available even in the Edgar system. We also have the ability to share these queries across staff and team members. So if you're seeking to recreate a reporting scenario without having to recreate the entire query, you can do that. You can simply use somebody else's query and run it against your segment or the market you're looking at. You can also do what, what's obvious in any proprietary application, and that's looking at redlining of changes. Now you can do that directly on top of the report. I can compare this quarter to last quarter for a narrative disclosure in the footnotes. That's a very useful uh, analytical tool for our analyst teams. And there's other things that we're also enabling, such as tonality analysis, using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to modify, to, not to modify, but to assess changes in tone of the narrative disclosures and to compare that change in tone to the change in the numeric results of the similar disclosures. That's a very interesting analytical idea when you see a change in tonality that's going in the opposite direction of the numerical results. It's simply an area that deserves a little bit additional attention. Next slide, please. So to further discuss this, there's some enhancements that are available uh, to both producers, the filers themselves, and to investors from the structured disclosures. Enhanced coverage. So the capital benefits, and this is particularly true for smaller registrants who lack analyst coverage. Uh, they can realize lower capital cost and higher liquidity. And in the appendix to my deck, there's some academic research that backs up this point. Additionally, there's some process benefits to automate reporting assembly and review controls. The disclosure checklist I mentioned earlier, uh, validation through data quality rules, updating and versioning, imagine that. Anytime you change the report, you can automate the checks to make sure your math still works and to leverage uh, many of those steps what have currently and may be manual. Uh, provide strategic insights by easily accessing the disclosures from your peers and or best practice disclosure examples. And then again, the disclosure benchmarking. Again, that's happening directly inside the report that's the augmented reality piece. There's been some articles that have been written by the Financial Executive Institute uh, on the benefits of XBRL to preparers, uh, and the, that example was done by a small reporting company. Additionally, for consumers, um, as I mentioned earlier, this information is not what somebody thinks a company reports. This is actually what the company reports, and it's immediately accessible. So under the time is money scenario, this information is immediately accessible by the analyst, literally within seconds after they report it. It's also machine readable, which that's lowers processing frictions and enables broader coverage of registrants and disclosures. That's one of the reasons why XBRL is so powerful for enhancing the liquidity of small reporting companies. Further, the labels are also available in a broad range of languages. That enables consumers to view table elements in a familiar language that may not be English, it may not be Spanish, it may not be Japanese or Korean, but in the language that the consumer is familiar with. Now, this also levels the playing field with respect to information asymmetry. Machine readable disclosures can be more effectively accessed and analyzed. Previous informational advantages like those enjoyed by company insiders or large institutional investors over non insiders and smaller investors, those are reduced. Further price informa information at this, detailed tagging of financial statements improves this 
and provide particularly, and that's particularly important to newer registrants. What this means to me is, in other words, if companies' financials are machine readable, its stock price is more likely to reflect the fundamentals of the business. Now, next bullet, as reported, more timely, lower cost. This is sort of what I've been saying all along. Time is money. You get the hands, you get all the information in the hands of the analyst sooner rather than later at a lower cost. And finally, on this list, this information is structured, so it's already ready to be processed by AI and ML engines. Um, I was speaking at a conference the other day, and a literally a rocket scientist who does nothing but artificial intelligence work told the audience that he spends well over 90% of his time simply structuring the unstructured data well before he can apply his algorithms to it. Well, with the XBRL data, he's got a lot more time on his hands to actually focus on his algorithms because he can immediately consume and process the structured disclosures into the AI systems. Let me give you a quick overview on the next slide of the SEC program. Uh, this began with a voluntary program back in 2005 that allowed operating companies and later mutual funds to voluntarily submit XBRL data as exhibits. Following in 2009, the structured financial statements and notes were mandated uh, with a three-year implementation program. In 2017, the commission recognized the IFRS taxonomy and made it available for foreign registrants using the IFRS taxonomy. Um, additionally, in 2017, the uh, commission recognized and made available inline XBRL for a phase in, I'm sorry, that was 2019. We phased in inline XBRL, and today that's a mandatory requirement for all registrants. Now, we make these data, uh, these structured disclosures available in a range of methods. Um, through the Edgar system, where it's a filing, you can see that both in human and machine readable, as the example I showed you earlier for the United. Uh, but we also make it available through an RSS feed and data sets on our website that we update monthly. And as many of you may know, because it came out this morning in the Expert International Newsletter, it's also now available as an API from the Edgar system. So that API is a beta, but it's available now to expose all of the structured disclosures immediately and directly through the uh, application programming interface to the Edgar system. Um, now, as part of the Edgar submission process, there are some warning messages for filers with certain data quality errors, uh, such as the disclosure that might be tagged with an out, outdated disclosure element or tag element. So those are there. I would also be remiss in mentioning the Xbureau US consortium has developed a incredible set of data quality rules that are freely available and open to anyone who wants to use them. Some of those have been incorporated into the Edgar filing process, but all of them have been incorporated into the taxonomy. So those are available and available for use, and it would be, I would strongly encourage registrants to take advantage of those. Let's move on to the next slide. So some of the lessons that have been learned through our process and implementation are that education is super important. It's useful to explain the why uh, and to highlight why the existing paper model does create some misinformation and um, cost barriers that can actually be removed by standardization. It's very important, I think, to start with inline. Um, it's human and machine readable and gives you all these additional features and capabilities to the users, which include preparers, by the way. Um, Company-specific extensions, those are very difficult for machines to consume as they lack any context of the relationships to the core taxonomy. Um, and so I'll come back to that in a minute, but that's a key point that many people have a difficult time consuming those unless there's something available. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I think it's important to make sure that, that people are aware of the incredibly growing number of tools, not only for production, but for consumption of the data and the, the status of that environment today, the, the enabling tools is a complete shift from where they was uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, make the reporting data easily and freely available. I think you get that in terms of what's available for research and analysis. And certainly the, the amount of analysis and structured disclosure to me has been stunning. 
um, and the data quality errors that I mentioned earlier, um, those are also uh, correlated with report restatements. And I think they reflect on reporting process and control weaknesses as well. So the data quality is a key point, and I would encourage people again to use data quality rules. So some stakeholder engagement, the Edgar team has recently started meeting um, with the vendors and providing uh, beta updates to the time series, the presentations of any new ideas. Um, really encourage registrants to use those data quality rules, as I mentioned. Um, and we also coordinate with the standards group, both the US GAAP and IFRS standards bodies. I uh, think that's a key point in terms of um, how to move the thing forward and make sure the taxonomies continue to be timely and relevant. So next slide, here are some topics for further for future consideration. Um, to, just to continue to improve this and the data quality rules, I think, are at the top of this list uh, because those can be very helpful in not only identifying those clearly obvious rules, but also in identifying some risk oriented ideas and some more subjective assessments. Um, the company specific disclosures, uh, the commission does not have a current rule on anchoring, uh, but I, we, we do accept anchors through Edgar. And I think the anchors can go a long way in helping the marketplace to consume uh, these company specific disclosures, which I personally think are very important as part of the company's uh, report. And I say they're important when they're used appropriately to identify something that's very unique to the company. Uh, they're also very revealing if they're used to uh, explain something that's in the standard taxonomy. So when I see a company specific disclosure for revenue or total assets, I know there's a process problem there. Uh, block text tagging may be useful to other parts of the annual report well beyond the financial statements. And of course, third party assurance of the inline reports may also be helpful in enhancing data quality by lowering the related cost of the assurance processes through improved process automation and quality assessments. Um, so I think that's another opportunity where standardization can actually be very helpful in lowering costs while improving quality. Now, structuring may also extend well beyond the financial statements. I think we saw a comment earlier about ESG. Uh, and certainly there are a number of ESG expiral taxonomies out there, and I think you should expect to see more because um, I think that's an important part of the discussion. I'll say no more on that uh, today, uh, but enhanced data analytics applications and functionality, I've given you sort of a taste of that in what I've talked about with the inline expiral open source viewer. Um, and I think to leverage the open information model, to tailor the technical format of XBRL data to the needs of the data owners. That might be CSV for some, it might be XFIL for others, it might be JSON for even others, and who knows what's next, but the consortium seems to be right on the top of these emerging formats and capabilities of the standards. And additionally, there's gonna be many other topics for future consideration as you gain experience. Um, so, just to close up and, and to thank you again for the opportunity to, um, to share a few thoughts with you today on the next slide. That's about as much as I can put into a 30 minute presentation. But in short, the concept I'll leave with you is supply chain standardization works to lower processing costs while improving quality and throughput. That's just like how the barcode works in the retail supply chain. Um, if you can go back to one more slide, uh, there is an email address here if you have any questions. Uh, the team at structureddata at sec.gov is happy to address your questions. Uh, and with that, again, I say thank you for the opportunity to participate in this great session and to answer any questions that may, may come. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Mike Willis, for your graceful presence and taking your time out here for these participants and making the presentations us and we get uh, we get the you know future direction that we are to go thank you so much now i would like to take the opportunity of inviting uh, mr vijay sahani director from uh, webtel electrosoft private limited he will address on xbrl in india journey need and opportunities so i welcome and invite you mr sahani thanks so First of all, uh, 
I would like to uh, thank SOCM for this opportunity. And I was thinking, okay, when is it that I'm going to present my PPT uh, to this audience? But uh, to speak after Mike, I think that itself uh, is a big challenge. So I will try my best for that. Just a second. So friends, uh, my topic is journey, need and opportunities. Hello, am I audible? Yes, okay. Mr. Sahani, you are audible. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So it is uh, journey, need and opportunities. So now as far as journey is concerned, uh, I think this is more historical. Uh, I would not spend much of time on these slides, but we started it uh, in 2007 when uh, IES, uh, uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants of India was the uh, member to the uh, this, uh, and then thereafter Ministry of Company Affairs, then Reserve Bank of India, Security Exchange uh, Board of India, Insurance Regulator, that is IRDA. They have all taken this uh, new initiative and each one of them has come up with one initiative or the other. Then thereafter, uh, we have got Ministry of Company Affairs actually started this in 2000, uh, just a second. Yeah, in 2008, we started implementation of XBRL as far as the RBR was concerned. Initially, it was just seven returns which they started with, and thereafter, uh, it was 90 forms which they actually implemented, and there are many more uh, which they are in the process of doing it. And the idea was that, yes, uh, everything should be standardized, and the information, uh, the regulator will be able to uh, do the due surveillance and monitoring of the information provided by the different banks. And then even uh, SEBI uh, got into it and they instructed uh, different stock exchanges to go about, go out about it. Uh, thereafter, uh, Bombay Six, uh, Stock Exchange, they have already, uh, Mr. Neeraj Kulshra had shared that, okay, they are getting more than 1 lakh of filing in one year, and which is quite a lot. In the second phase, they have started the corporate governance report to be submitted in XBRL format. And in the phase three, even the voting rights are being submitted uh, in XBRL mode. And from 2006, uh, it has been made mandatory uh, for corporate uh, all corporates. Now, IRDA has also started its own work, and uh, they have also come out with a RFP. And uh, here also, uh, as you know, that uh, there are different stakeholders like uh, uh, insurance agents. Then we have got uh, brokers, then we have got insurance companies, we have got uh, users, that is claimants. So they are doing, all, and they, they actually deal with more than around about uh, 275 forms, which are there in the RFP, and they are uh, in the process of getting it uh, done all over again in XPRL. So as far as MCA was concerned, uh, it was done in a phased manner. So in the first phase, obviously, we started with the CNI, that is commercial industrial uh, for companies, and there was a limit, uh, there was a terminal limit for that. And then uh, we started with the cost XPRL also simultaneously. In the second phase, uh, obviously, index uh, was uh, introduced. And in third phase, obviously, we have lowered the limit uh, from 500 crores to 250 crores. And in the fourth phase, obviously, we are talking about NBFCs and banking companies, insurance companies. So to uh, give some more idea about it, so all the companies which are listed in India and its subsidies are included, and thereafter companies having turnover exceeding 100 crores or more, or uh, then companies having a paid up capital of 5 uh, crores or more are liable to file under XPRL. So these are some more explanation. I would uh, not spend much time on this. Obviously, 
I think uh, this is more historical in nature, so I will just skip it. But yes, we are eagerly waiting for uh, the taxonomy of uh, banking NBFCs, insurance companies. And uh, I think only if we can clarify why and when uh, it's going to be implemented. So now the total turnover limit we have already discussed. So now let's go to the background, uh, how did this all over again? So before 2000, 2000, uh, how we used to operate every single chartered accountant or company secretary who used to interact with the ministry, they have to go physically and visit the ROC offices. And then obviously MCA was introduced, everybody in the business thought that, okay, our work will be reduced, but I think nothing of that sort of thing happened. And then once this was implemented, so uh, there was a discussion why we are going to, uh, we are going for these PDF files. Because at that point in time, income tax department was already operating and they were taking the data only and only in XML format. There was no PDF file which we need to attach as far as income tax department or any other department like PF or ESI in Indian context if you are talking. But MCA took a conscious call that yes, this is a registry and then we should be having uh, the entire structure uh, available at our end, right? So they introduced that, okay, we will be having these form 23 AC, ACA, and you will be uh, giving the basic data there, and then you will be attaching the PDF file to it. And then uh, from there onwards, uh, now we have to see, now we are in 2021, uh, has a lot changed there? I think we are still operating as a registry only. and are we getting the complete data? Obviously not. We are getting PDF files, but are we getting it in FPO data format? That is not the case even today, right? So we are getting balance sheet and annual reports, but obviously the complete data is not there, right? So the concept of XBR itself is that, okay, we will be having content over the form. So it is not that we are having all the PDF but we yeah. limited is more than 13 lakh to work upon that data. Content we not. So on the left hand side, uh, for the benefit of, uh, I'm not going into detail how XPR works. But for the uh, better understanding of uh, the entire audience, so say for example, on the right hand side, I've got uh, name of my company and address. And on the right hand side, you can see that we are having it in XML tags. So what is the difference? The difference is that yes, because uh, in case of Word or Excel, why we do all the data work in Excel? Because we have got rows and columns there and we can retrieve the data faster. We can do a lot of analysis. Similarly, in case of XBRL also, if the entire annual report is available in XML format or in a tag format, obviously it is going to be very, very easy for the regulator, for the investors. So in this case, that form 23 AC, how we started it. So it is the PDF file which used to be attached with it, right? And today also we are in the same conditions, right? So it is, there are more than, uh, 13 lakh companies uh, with MCA, which are active. Uh, total 19 lakh companies were there, but obviously few were stuck off. And now we have got 13 lakh active companies. So we compare uh, that if, if a company is filing its uh, annual return in uh, AOC 4 now and is attaching its PDF file to it, the size can go up to 2.5 MB. And to analyze that data, I think it is not possible uh, for the ministry or for uh, any analysis, analytical company to actually analyze all the PDFs, they will not be able to do, right? But if we compare it with XBRL, we can be having the entire data in a structured format in less than 100 KB. And I think it is very, very easy to analyze. Now, let us compare how we stand as compared to uh, US and UK's concern. 
So in US, uh, primarily, broadly, they are uh, insect filing at least. They were having a presentation file, uh, calculation file, label file, reference, and then instance document. There was a set of five files which you, uh, we used to file and compress and upload it there, right? And it was a complete process. So uh, the output which we were getting was similar to uh, what we were filing. So it was, uh, rendering was uh, perfect. And in the case of UK, they are filing inline XPR. So there also, uh, Mike has already uh, uh, taken up this matter, but yes, it is very readable. That is inline uh, XBRL is very readable. So if we say uh, the UK model, it is uh, applicable to almost 100% companies and rendering is same, simpler, and is uh, and readily available tools are there, very cost effective. Both best of both the worlds are there. That is that layman can easily uh, read it. Uh, it is very human readable. And at the same point in time, regulators or any uh, NLS, they can get all the contents uh, accordingly and they can analyze the data pretty easily. So IEXPRL, we could have told that yes, it is India XPRL, but uh, it was not to be. And uh, probably as uh, Atul, my friend has suggested that uh, we are in the process and uh, shortly we will be actually taking good, uh, some uh, great step toward implementation of IXBRL and then obviously we will be able to expand the scope. So as far as uh, XBRL India is concerned, we need to submit only the instance document as compared to US. So we have neither followed the US approach, neither we have followed the UK approach. So what are the fallbacks? Readability is pretty poor and uh, all the PDF files which are generated using those instance document because the presentation calculation files are static in nature. So in the first instance, if you download Reliance balance sheet from their website and then get a certified copy from the MCA portal, and if you compare the two, so any any person or a judge, if you are pro providing a certified copy, will be saying that oh, these oh, these two are totally two different documents. So, so readability is a big challenge there. Now, uh, now even in case of uh, BSC RBI, who have in uh, who have started XBRL in a big way, they are also taking just XML files. They are also not taking any presentation or calculation files and either they have not implemented IEXBRL. So they are generating XML files and they are uploading it on the portal. So, so to say, even income tax department uh, prior to when uh, uh, MCA or uh, BSC, uh, when they adapted it, they are already following that XML. And now from this year onwards, they have changed it to JSON format. And there also their forms are pretty uh, exhaustive, uh, going up to 35 pages. And information is pretty detailed there also. But they have never claimed that they are doing XBRL because of the fact that their forms are static. Even in case of MCA or in case of BSC or uh, RBA also, the forms are pretty static. They have provided the Excel file. People are punching the data there and getting it Obviously, there it can be possible, but as far as the MC is concerned, the way the annual reports are prepared, either we need to provide the presentation files and other relevant files, or else we should actually go for IXPRL. Now, while we were uh, going through the data of different companies who have uh, filed their returns, and they have found that uh, as far as the tagging was concerned, there were huge challenges uh, which we found uh, on the data front. And uh, even ministry has come up with a notification uh, late in 2012, uh, circular was 33, where when they were saying that uh, if proper incorrect mapping is done, so obviously there will be penal provisions, but uh, with the type of uh, infrastructure we are having, probably not much was done there. So these are a few of the points which we have observed that uh, there are even we have found that there are companies uh, who are having actually uh, cash flow statement have not tagged the cash flow statement uh, at all in their XBRL document. 
and uh, even uh, information of subsidiary was not tagged and part and related party information were also not tagged and uh, different figures were there uh, in the actual reports the figures were uh, given in say thousands or in lakhs but in xbr it was uh, on actual basis or vice versa and there we have found there was issues in uh, uh, footnote taggings also and then uh, on different heads uh, people were not using uh, appropriate tags to do it and probably we are not having a proper structure so to give some examples to it that yes uh, in the balance sheet you can observe that there is a uh, uh, there is a line item called advertisement and brand marketing and we have got figures there and uh, conveniently the company has targeted with uh, traveling and conveyance obviously the balance sheet is going to tally and uh, nobody is going to but is it the right in kind of information which the users or the investors uh, really want and similarly uh, here we have uh, found that bad debts written off uh, they were tagged in other provisions created, but actually we have got a separate tag for bad debt uh, advances written off. So similarly, uh, what we can see that uh, in AFC 4, we have discussed that majority uh, companies are just filling the information on the face of the form and then uh, attaching the static PDF files. Sometimes these PDF files are not very readable. And uh, we have seen in few cases that uh, in the in company A, we have by mistake or uh, I can't say whether it was done uh, willfully, uh, they have attached the uh, PDF format of uh, PDF file of uh, company B. So that is also uh, which, which uh, can be obviously dealt when if we are going for the complete XBR and we are not attached to the and so as far as uh, XBRL is concerned, uh, issues which we can plug is the scope can uh, be increased. There was no increase. Initially, we we were told to believe that, yes, we, we are starting with 25, 30,000 companies. And times to come, uh, probably all the companies will be coming under this preview. But probably uh, the type of uh, response or the expectation which the regulator was having that yes we will be getting data and then we will be processing it in this way or that way probably that uh, thing has not worked out and then why uh, department has actually taken a back seat and not uh, expanded the scope and bfc taxonomy uh, it has been uh, on a discussion that yes, yes now we are going to release it but uh, many years have already gone by and then NBFC taxonomy has not been finalized as, uh, as yet. Similarly, in case of insurance, banking companies also, the taxonomy is not ready. Now, if we uh, compare it uh, with other countries, yes, uh, we have got more than 13 lakh companies uh, with the ministry. And companies which are filing XBRLs are approximately 30 lakh only. And active companies in US, uh, UK, as per the uh, website, is that there are 2.8 million companies. And companies who are filing XBRL are approximately 1.9 million. So, what are the need of the R? So, we need to increase the scope of XBRL. And because the scope was not increased, so actually companies have not purely invested on the technology and uh, quality of the reporting professionals is also not there and uh, companies who really start xbrl and said that okay yes we are going to start it and uh, we this the thing that yes there can be different approaches that you, you can have a software you can just uh, use your balance sheet import the word file or excel file as in case of webtel software we just import it and you can start tagging different facilities that yes, uh, it can auto tag, it can have some sort of artificial intelligence can be built. But this is the approach. Yes, we, we just import the data. But once this technology was introduced in India, the industry was of the opinion, yes, we would like to uh, this uh, system to our, our uh, ERP systems and we will see that the uh, the time period of actually producing the accounts is going to be reduced. But because of the fact that 
the limited uh, companies were available. People were not investing sufficiently on the technology and uh, so to say uh, in India, we were doing outsourcing for all other countries like uh, US, UK, Singapore, and that work also will be shifting slowly and gradually uh, out of India because of the fact that we have not invested sufficiently in the technology and because we don't have knowledge in India, obviously we won't be able to serve the world uh, accordingly. So quality of uh, professional also have not grown. People generally try to outsource uh, their work and uh, it is very difficult to maintain um, good XBRL professionals in corporates because of the fact there is limited filing there. So we need to cover more companies to bring the companies which are not there in XBRL so far. Uh, obviously, it is going to give uh, standardization to the present data. It will reduce the cumbersome process uh, by the companies by filing ASC4 and the manual filing of the data is concerned. Obviously, we will be getting uh, most of the. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, for the patient hearing and uh, I'm through with the uh, presentation. So, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Vijay Sahani sir, for presenting this Thank beautiful, you. Uh, you know, historical perspective as well as the current scenario and going forward what is expected in Indian context. Uh, now we have pleasure presence of Mr. Vinod Kashyap. Uh, Vinod Kashyap ji is the Indian national expert at ISOTC 295 Audit Data Services and founder NextGen. So he would uh, cover on the XPRL India issues, challenges, and way forward. So may I request Mr. Vinod Kashyapji to please take your session. Thank you, Santoshi. And good evening, everyone. Please allow me one minute to share my screen. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, sir. Your your slide is visible, sir. Okay. Okay. At the outset, first of all, I would like to congratulate and thank, say a big thank you to SOKM for taking this initiative to organize the International Conference on XBRL, which has not happened in a couple of years. In fact, these conferences help in updating the knowledge. Now, we have seen the presentation of Mike Willis, which was quite informative and useful. We have also seen the presentation from C. Atul Guptaji, past president ICI talked about IXBL. Maybe most of the professionals in India are not aware of this. So this kind of conferences help professionals in updating their knowledge. In my uh, half an hour's presentation, I'll try to discuss briefly about issues and challenges for XBRL in India and way forward. So my presentation will cover first is background, then issues and challenges, and what we should do next. In last five minutes or 10 minutes, if there is sufficient time, I'll be happy to answer in case there are any questions or queries. See, XBL has brought a paradigm shift from traditional format of hard copy filing to soft copies filing or machine readable data filing at MC, uh, MCA, BSC, JB, a limited form. But it was a major shift. Uh, when MCA mandated XBL based filing for certain class of companies, which included all listed companies in India and their Indian subsidiaries, the companies having a paid up capital of rupees 5 crore and above, all companies which are having a paid up uh, turnover of rupees 100 crore and above from financial year 2010 11 onwards. Then this certification, uh, this filing was unique in the sense that India became the first country to mandate some sort of assurance on XBL financial statements. And this certification was done by members of ICI, chartered accountants, company secretaries, and cost accountants. 
there are about say 28000 to 30000 companies which are covered in excel filing at mca which was introduced in the year 2011 2010 11 financial year means 31st march 2011 was the close of the year thereafter the filing started so after 10 years also the phase 1 is still continuing we have not yet moved to phase 2 recently in a webinar organized by sokm only she subhashan garg former finance secretary of india has talked about shifting of 1.3 million active indian companies to digital only accounting auditing and financial reporting it will help uh, strengthen the governance from government's point of view now let us discuss about issues and challenges now it is almost a decade uh, since excel has been implemented in india there are certain issues and challenges uh, i have tried to for the major issues the first one is the data is not being used for analytic purpose by mca where the major majority of filing is happening second is data quality for excel tagged financial data is not we uh, is not as good as it can be used by say investor investment analysis purpose even for some us company which is preparing say indian companies financial data on the line of us companies financial data analytics they have not used excel tag data because that's a, because of the reason that data quality people have apprehension about data quality third is see although india became the first country to mandate some sort of assurance on excel financial statement being filed at mca They, you know this assurance was in the form of certification now recently ceob has come out with a guidance note which said that involvement of auditor in csf filing in entire european union will be considered as audit this i'll discuss later one of the slide later then training in conferences has also been an issue because there are not many training or conferences on excel happening in india then last major issue is like we are not following the international best practices this i'll discuss in detail in subsequent slides now recently there was a media report which was published on october 5 of 2020 financial expert which says excel has not been as effective in early fraud detection as was expected intention was that as income tax and sales tax officials scrutinize tax filings the mc will have a similar facility to tax companies it has not missed to 10 years is a long time now for all these 10 years companies have paid the compliance costs additional cost of converting their financial statement financial data into excel format now there there has to be some accountability for that for 10 years this data has not been used for data analytic purpose now data quality issue was there in the first year itself in fact we have submitted a report on review of excel filing at mca for financial year 2010 11 we submitted a report on data quality issues and ministry had issued a circular addressed to the president of accounting bodies of india which talked about quality of excel filing certified by the professionals now subsequently we have not seen much change in improvement in data quality what are the reasons for that that we'll discuss it later and i happen to be the co-author of a paper which examined the a field study examining indian ministry of corporate affairs excel implementation where we discussed about all these issues and also suggested mca to shift the focus from document level certification to data level assurance This was published in Journal of Information Systems, Volume Thirty One, Issue Number One, in two thousand seventeen. Now, another major issue is that involvement of auditor in MCA filing is considered as certification. The guidance note issued by the Accounting Body of India says that it is certification. Now, recently, Committee of European Auditing Oversight Body has come out with the guidelines, which says auditors' involvement of financial statement in European single electronic format, which is uh, ESCF filing, is considered as audit. Now, so a review on the view taken earlier about the assurance of our Excel financial statements is required. Now, 
another issue is like there are not many training programs or conferences on exbel happening in india last conference which i could trace out on social media is happened in 2016 when uh, you know exbel india organized an international conference 2016 we are in 2021 now there is no conference no training program and if you look at other exbel jurisdictions say exbel us exbel europe there is every year there are some conferences and program organized for the stakeholders benefit to update the knowledge of stakeholders now one more issue is that we are not following international best practices some of them i've tried to identify and put in this slide which includes one is dedicated website for uh, isbel india the exbel jurisdiction all over the world have a dedicated website which provide necessary information provide information about conferences training programs rules guidance and quality isbel india has a website address when exbel was launched in india its website address was as given in the slide http exbel. Org.in. Now, now this you know this seems to have changed. I recently found that they, it it has been withdrawn. Now there is a page at Exbel International website whose address is given here. <laughs> Second is stakeholders involvement. Involvement is important if we want to improve the quality of Exbel filing, quality of Exbel in India. Now accounting you know see all over the world Exbel jurisdictions have involvement of. not only the accounting body of that particular country but also the software vendors service providers accounting firms but if we look at india we have only got two members as on date which is accounting body of india and institute of commerce secretaries of india there are no software vendors accounting firms involved in it that is lack of involvement of software vendors and top accounting firms means there is no inputs which is coming about the and status of exbel filing quality related issues or something which uh, which is very important to you know for the ensuring the right quality of exbel data is filed at mc and this committee is very important see all exbel jurisdictions have different committees which to look after that their particular domain now exbel india has got committee one is ex membership development committee which has got three members but in last 10 years this committee has got only two members icai and icsi <laughs> second is taxonomy development committee taxonomy development committee has got no expert who has got knowledge on exbel taxonomy third is audit committee now look at the work of audit committee the guidance note which was issued 10 years back Now at that time also I had certain apprehension about certification, and my first presentation at ICS platform also talked about assurance of our Excel financial statement. Our European uh, CEOB has come out with a guideline which says the involvement of auditor in ESF filing should be considered as audit. Now all accounting bodies in European Union are coming out with guidance notes or standards on audit of XBRL, and. there are invariably data quality committee at xbel jurisdiction we don't have any such committee in xbel india data quality has been considered to be you know the topmost issues at all xbel in jurisdiction so they come out with rules and guidance they come out with software certification and they also set up center for data quality now there is no such thing as uh, as in case of xbel india Now here is the screenshot of Exbel India's website in 2011-12. Its website address was exbel.org.in. Now it used to have taxonomy, circulars, how you can join, training member. Now if you try to, you know, load, try to do this address, what you will find is this: the site cannot be reached. It has been withdrawn. Uh, if I can remember correctly, it was withdrawn somewhere between 2016 and 17. now website of exbel international has a page on exbel india now so the new address is www.in.exbel.org now it has got as i said earlier members of exbel india are only two members one is the institute of chartered accountants of india second is the institute of commerce secretaries of india there is no software vendor no accounting for not even with force involved in it, you know then how the inputs will come 
These are the three committees which are there in Exbarrel India. Membership Development Committee, Taxonomy Development Committee. Now, Taxonomy Development Committee, now you see if anybody has got knowledge on Exbarrel Taxonomy. No. Now, because of this, the problem is the quality of Exbarrel tax data, which is available at MC today, it has not been used by investors, investment analysis for data analytics purpose. I, I remember one case very clearly, one of the US company which has got analysis of US company, listed company's financial data for last 25 years, was trying to do a similar thing for Indian company's financial data. They also decided not to use Excel tech data, which is available at MCA because they had reservation about the quality of Excel tech data, which is available today at MCA. Now, what should be done is the move forward to fall in line with the international best practice. One is like adoption of IXBL, as Mike Willis said in the, his presentation that SEC has adopted XBRL, IXBL based filing. Then second is we also need to reconsider about certification or audit of XBL financial statement that are being filed at MCA. Example is CEOB guidance on involvement of auditor in EACF filing in entire European Union. Then data quality is a big issue. So there's something needs to be done urgently to improve the quality of data which is being filed today. For this purpose, guidance, rules on data quality, and send a, you know, a committee should be set up for data quality. Data analytics is another area. See, Excel tech data is computer readable data, which can be easily used by computer systems for data analytics purpose. AI and ML can be used, like Mike Willis explained, how SEC is using Excel tech financial data for US listed companies for data analytics purpose. Similarly, data analysis for Indian companies should be done. Now, inline XBRL or IXBRL is an open standard that enables a single document to provide both human readable and structured and machine readable data. Here is an example of GLEIF report of 2018, which is available at XBRL International website. One is the human readable format, the another one is computer readable format or IXBRL format where the you know, data is tagged. Now, in this slide, you can see various regulators around the world who are using inline XBL today. SEC of US adopted IXBL reporting requirement in 2018 in a phased manner with three years implementation period. HMRC and Company House in UK have over 2 million companies fi filing IXBL at HMRC, which is the tax authority of U uh, UK equivalent to our central board of direct taxes in India and company house is equivalent to our MCA. Then Japan Financial Services Agency or GFSA Japan, around 9,000 companies and funds are submitting their financial data to Japan Financial Services Agencies in Japan in IXBL format. Danish Business Registrar has collected for 100,000 XBL, for, XBL formatted financial statement for registration and market information purpose. Then ESMA, European Securities Market Authority, has announced ACF filing for all listed companies and entire European Union. It was supposed to start from 1st January 2020, but one by one countries have extended it. Now it is supposed to start from 1st January 2021. Now recently, the Quality Council of India organized a webinar on accounting and finance services industry, where I have I also had the honor to share some thoughts on quality audit quality particular. And one of the recommendations which was included by Quality Council of India and sent to uh, you know uh, sent to the ministry was that. Audit of XBRL should be considered, you know, see, involvement of auditor in XBRL filing at MCA should be considered an audit instead of certification. On data quality, here is an example, like XBRL US has got 
rules and guidance, software certification. It has also checks and filings to see the result. It has also set up a center for data quality committee. They have a data quality committee itself, which regularly reviews this and comes out with regular guidance on data quality. Unfortunately, this has not happened in case of India in last 10 years. We don't have a committee on data quality in XBEL. XBEL tag financial data of companies, the structured data, which can be read by computer systems and can be used for data analytics purpose. It can provide useful insights to various regulators, investors, and for investment analysis purpose. Now, in case there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. In case there are no questions, thank you, SOKM, for providing me this opportunity to, to share a few thoughts on issues, challenges, and way forward for Exberry in India. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Binod Kashyap, sir, for uh, enlightening uh, kind words, presentation, and being as a convener to this conference for since the beginning and helping us to you know deliver this conference after so long here in India itself. So uh, now let me take the uh, opportunity of inviting uh, Rajendra Srivastava, Dr. Rajendra P. Srivastava, sir. He's there. He has joined. So I welcome and invite you, sir, to please take your session and uh, enlighten uh, to our audience participants. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, how do I share my screen? Uh, I think last time uh, Mike helped me. <laughs> Mike, uh, can you tell me how to share my screen? No. <laughs> I think that could, is, you, uh, could you share your PPTs with us? Well, uh, I would like to manage that, you know, because uh, I want to go back and forth between. Thanks. Anna. Okay, so I am asking my team Vikas to please give the rights to share uh, his presentation. Okay, Mr. Vikas, because, to please. Uh, yeah. sir, I have sir, sent my slides, but still I want to control it. Sir, the sharing rights have been to you. So there is a button, okay. third button on um, share. Okay, good. That's perfect. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir, we your screen now. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, conference. Um, this is early morning. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, it's right now 5, 5, uh, 40 or 535 uh, in Kansas. Uh, <clears throat> I was up last night. To, uh, for another conference I had at I am uh, Amritsar, <laughs> so that was late night, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, so it has been busy. Uh, but I'm going to share some of my thoughts. Uh, I, I think uh, I am probably the one from academia. So in academics, we have a different perspective, and uh, I think that's what I'm going to present now. Uh, as students on XBRL document, I think I have uh, been involved on XBRL for a long time. I think when it was it, uh, in its infancy, in fact, we, we did a project. I think my uh, friends here who are on the uh, panel, uh, they all are aware of it. We were developing a, a technology using the internet to create uh, uh, tag documents, uh, you know, from uh, SEC filings, especially the balance sheet income statement. And in fact, we got a, a project uh, to work on to see and validate uh, and find the weakness in the taxonomy that was the first version came in uh, around 2000. So that's how uh, I have been involved now on more than 20 years, uh, published some uh, articles. Uh, so my question coming from academia was that, you know, if you think about assurance, uh, how uh, do you uh, do that? What are the, some of the conceptual uh, framework? So the first you have to understand how you create the XBRL document and uh, I teach also uh, a kind of a couple of sessions on XBRL in my classes in auditing. Uh, so the first part is, what does it mean when you create XBRL instance document? Uh, in, in simple terms, uh, it simply means that, well, you have a document uh, uh, in text form or HTML and translate that into uh, XBRL instance document. 
And so what are the, the, the important points there when you translate it? So I will go through some of these concepts. <clears throat> so outline of my presentation is just uh, you know, what it means uh, uh, to give assurance. Uh, then uh, assertion-based approach, what does it mean? What is it assertion-based approach? I think it's very critical. I think uh, those who are in practice, I'm sure uh, they are very, very aware of uh, all this. But that provides a foundation in terms of the thought process, what kind of evidence you do, what procedure you perform and all that. Uh, if you lack as, you know, this concept, then there could be uh, a problem in terms of doing the you know, good job in terms of uh, providing assurance on the, the information. Uh, so I'll talk about the conceptual framework. We published a paper as long time now, I think around the time when uh, SEC uh, and uh, I think uh, AICP actually, AICP at that time was thinking of conceptually what are some of the assertions they came up with. And I was working in parallel. We published the academic paper comparing what they had. Uh, and then some issues still remains on XBRL incident document. You know, I'm, I'm sure uh, some of you may be aware. So I come from academic side to to just what we do, you try to understand and criticize and comment and improve. Uh, so uh, just uh, uh, what uh, Vinod Ji was saying, I think uh, the committee who are involved here should also involve academics because they have very different perspective. In the US, we have a lot of uh, uh, close uh, collaboration between practice and academics. And that is how the whole framework and concepts and ideas are defined. Uh, that I see is missing in terms of uh, entire uh, Indian system because I went with one of my, you know, actually two professors, uh, friends and colleagues uh, that have worked very closely with AICPA and audit quality and all, you know, one name is Ted Mark. I don't know how many of you know. We had a meeting in, in Delhi. Uh, to just uh, encourage them to involve uh, academics with uh, all this uh, committee work and uh, uh, shaping up the standard. And uh, it was uh, disheartening to see that uh, they had a different uh, feeling about uh, academics uh, uh, to be involved in, in their activities. Uh, and uh, in, in the US, I don't know how many of you are aware of this uh, publication called Philosophy of Auditing. Philosophy of Auditing. Uh, that was published long time back, and you'll be surprised that I believe that almost 100% of that uh, publication, that book, uh, ideas, have been incorporated in auditing standard. Uh, philosophy of auditing, when I talk to people uh, outside of uh, auditing, they sometimes uh, <laughs> laugh at me that, well, what are you talking about philosophy of auditing? What is there about philosophy? But it is such a rich document, it is available on uh, these days uh, on Amazon because I think it's a uh, 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 out of print. <clears throat> okay, so here is a, uh, a you know a screenshot of a uh, you know, typical uh, 10K annual report of this company. This is uh, just the uh, most current uh, available, and the reason I have it because uh, I could get the traditional XBRL document uh, for this particular filing. Uh, because the U.S. has gone into inline XBRL, which is much uh, uh, better way to present information uh, so that the human being can read it and uh, still computers can use it. Uh, so traditionally, the XBRL started that we should convert this document in a format where a computer can read. Uh, so, so this is uh, all the company-related information. Uh, you have uh, the, the filing date. Uh, you have the the you know company's name and all these other details. Uh, so here is uh, information about uh, company, and I don't want to go through the whole technology of how you tag these things because that is something that people in XBRL should be aware of. And so you have to talk about uh, what is the entity, what is the CIK, uh, you know, uh, what is the time frame. All kinds of things uh, needs to be uh, tagged. And so, so here is just an example that, uh, you know, here is a, uh, an ID uh, that defines, this is uh, the context uh, reference uh, that defines the company's uh, identification, the CIK 
number. This is the CIK number for that company. Then another date. So the date defined is uh, there are two kinds of date. You know, balance sheet is of a given date as of that period, and and then income statements revenues for a period. So beginning and ending. So here is another definition uh, of uh, how it is a starting date and a beginning <laughs> date. Okay, so ending date. Uh, then another one here. Uh, this is this is talking about uh, again, uh, you know, defining the 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 another ID contract reference. Mr. Jatin so, your voice is interrupting. Please mute. Keep yourself mute. Okay, so so first you have all the company's information. Now here is example of balance sheet. So this is the balance sheet is being sought. Uh, that talked about you know all the balance sheet items in the cash and period and all that and uh, Early on. Uh, and you can see the value here uh, the cash has uh, this uh, value one million twenty three thousand one seventy eight and all that now if you look at this as a human being we can read and understand that yes you know this thing is number in a dollar this <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is for the uh, period uh, year end uh, December 31st, 2020. And it is current asset and all this. So, all this information, now when you convert it, translate it, I mean, a simple language, we have to convert it in a way that a computer can understand all that. That if it looks at current uh, uh, cash, it understands that is a current asset, it understands it is in a dollar amount, uh, US dollar. Uh, it is in this many units, you know, uh, for this company, for this period, all those details have to be. And so in, in uh, XML taxonomy, I mean, uh, language or XBRL language, uh, you have to have a tag for this term cash. But then, that you have to, then that you have to associate the attributes. That means cash, this belongs to this company for this period uh, uh, in, in this uh, unit. Uh, you know, all that should be there. So here is the, uh, you know, translation of this in uh, XBRL. So you can see, uh, you know, so there are some different tags. And this one is, uh, you know, tag that has all those line items. So here is that particular information. I was talking about the cash. So if you look at the cash, cash and cash equivalent, that's the at carrying value. So that is the tag right now SEC has. And you can see the uh, prefix is US GAP. So it says that it is US GAP taxonomy and the element name is cash and cash equivalent. And then these attributes, unit reference is US dollar, the unit reference is uh, this particular period that I showed you that defines the instant, that means December 31st, 2020. And this is the accuracy decimal zero. That means uh, there is no decimal or it is just uh, whatever number that is given there, but you can have in millions or in thousand. And that's what this one defines, you know, decimals. Right now it is zero means the whole number with no assumed uh, uh, unit, uh, just uh, in, in units. Uh, then this one is the, the uh, total, the current asset. You can see the assets. Now, <clears throat> Enlarging that uh, particular thing a little bit more, so you can see that we have all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, attributes, so unit reference, conference, and all that. And so, so now when I'm auditing, I have to make sure all these dimensions that well, it is has the right tag, uh, it has the right, uh, you know, unit reference and all the attributes that defines this particular tag. I cannot miss any of this because if I miss, then my information is wrong. So it has to be. And, and another point here that sometime, uh, especially the, the people who are not familiar with all this, uh, they think that if the XBRL incident document is audited or assured or certified, that means the information is correct. Well, that is not true because it is as good as the document that you are translating from. And so if the original and annual report is, uh, has errors, of course your translation will be in error. That is what is going to be. So simply say that what document you have, 
on the information in when we convert into XBRL, we have exactly transferred that information into this language. So if that is the problem there, we have that problem. But the translation can uh, add further uh, problems too. And that is where the certification or assurance or whatever you call has to come that well. We have translated this particular original document and it represents true and fair what that document is. But the question is, what is that true and fair? And so that is what we are going to talk about and, and, and uh, see what can be done. Uh, here is another one. This is Microsoft uh, uh, most recent uh, annual report from SSC site. And thanks to uh, my friend, uh, Eric Cohen, I approached, I think these people who are in practice, I think they are more current into all that. <laughs> so I thought, well, I, I must ask, uh, you know, about the current situation because uh, I have been retired now for a year or two and uh, busy in some other stuff. So, uh, but it's still what we did uh, 10 years back is still relevant. And that's what I want to focus on. So this was, oh, and the most of these uh, companies are filing now in uh, inline XBRL. So I want to show you. So this is the document without any uh, tags. Uh, I know this is uh, uh, another one. Uh, now, this one here is the balance sheet. So let me take you to uh, the original document. This is now in line. So you can see that there are some tags here. This one, if I do, it shows the tag. So this is in line, uh, which is helps you reader. So this is HTML document, but HTML document is how we are familiar with reading any text on um, the web, but all the business relevant information, important information is tagged and is highlighted, you can see. So click on it, it'll show you the tag and all of the relevant information that I was telling you in terms of the technology. Here is the balance sheet, let's see. If I do, okay, balance sheet is, uh, I'll have to go to, Balance sheet. Yeah, look, look at that. So, so you see the, the lines, uh, like the first one, current asset, and these are the two values. And when I click on one, then I see the tag and a lot of other information. So the, this is the tag, cash and cash equivalent to US GAAP, is value, is period, and all those things that uh, really defines in the background. And that is what, so it comes from XBRL, all the taxonomy, and it's the you know uh, schema and everything except the the good thing about inline is that it uh, comes right on the html document so we don't have to worry about too much in terms of trying to understand what is going on but as a uh, you know uh, software uh, or computer you can read it because these are all tag information <clears throat> now let me go back and so so this is so Microsoft, this is just the image that I wanted to capture in case my internet didn't work. Okay, so you can see these numbers are tagged. And here is the information about uh, the tag and the attributes uh, about these things. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the definition of excellence? Well, we decided that we should have a definition, although the definition was already given by SEC final, you know, final rule. And they said that, uh, you know, interactive data, that's what the uh, XBRL instant document uh, is called. So interactive data must meet investors' uh, uh, confidence. I have a little thing that keeps showing me. Uh, hope it is not disturbing. <clears throat> but in general, we wanted to say that the x balance document is a true representation of the electronic document, whether it is ASCII or HTML filed with the SEC. It doesn't have to be filed with the SEC. It could be filed with the SEBI and whoever. But what it means is it is a true representation of the, the document that we are translating or converting into XBL format. So what is it? And assertion based approach provides conceptual framework. And I have uh, been working on this for almost uh, 
a long time. Uh, when I came from physics to accounting and auditing, I, it provided me uh, a, a kind of a, a look from a different perspective. And it has helped uh, me publish a lot of original articles. I published, uh, I think you may have seen my CV, uh, more than 110 papers. And a lot of it is based on the audit process and you know how <clears throat> one should think about audit process. Um, so assessment based is good. Uh, you can see a balance sheet. You know these are some of the line items: uh, cash, accounts receivable, inventory, and all that. Uh, but uh, if I uh, want to give it, you know, uh, opinion, well, what do I do? So, so if somebody says, well, all right, you as an auditor come and audit my balance sheet, and I have all these ac you know, accounts, what do I do? And so, for example, suppose you have fixed assets, you know, and you have ten million loss of uh, property, a building. Uh, and uh, when do I say that, yes, this building uh, I have audited and is fairly stated? Well, that is not clear unless you define these assertions. And in fact, I used to ask my students in the class that <clears throat> what does it mean when uh, you say that uh, this particular account is fairly stated, you know? Uh, and invariably, uh, most of them will say when it is valued properly. So $10 million, if it is valued properly, then we'll give you an opinion. And valuation, you can check on the market uh, <clears throat> the price and uh, you know the, the the market of the building around the uh, neighborhood and all that. Fine, but when I ask them, well, what if it doesn't exist? Then say, oh yeah, 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 we have to go and check it physically. Go and check it that it really is, exists, and that's fine. Then I ask them, well, what if I don't own it? I just put on my ba ba balance sheet. They say, oh yes, we have to check for the ownership. So that you know so important. You have to have a credible evidence for each assertion. And so AICPA has come up with, it was uh, in 2006, they defined, uh, I think uh, around, yeah, that time, uh, the assertion. So now they have three segments, one for account balance, I mean balance, so four, four of these assertions, it does exist, the asset exists, or liability exists. We have included all the transactions related to that particular account, completeness, rights and obligation. We have the right and obligation uh, about the liabilities and rights to use the assets and valuation means it is valued properly. Then a certain base of transaction. And this is again, very, very important to understand because a design of in, in, uh, internal control system must be based on these assertions because any of these assertions are uh, not true. <clears throat> of course, the transaction is not recorded properly. And then this, this disclosure. So any of these assertions are not met. That means you are not really looking at the disclosure uh, properly. And so now, I think when I started teaching, you know, 30, almost 38 years back in 80s, uh, even teachers, professors were not very clear about all these assertions, but academics kept hammering and talking about it. And now it is in the standard. But this came from the original uh, book of uh, philosophy of auditing by Maus and Saraf uh, during early 60s. Uh, so same thing. So I, uh, given my background, uh, we were looking on a paper. I had a student in uh, information system, and he was working on information quality, uh, especially in the medical domain, healthcare industry. And so we started looking into literature and found out that the basic assertions uh, had some holes. And it was actually the research was done by MIT people. They have every year conference, MIT uh, quality conference uh, in Boston. <clears throat> I, um, we studied it and put the paper together and we were really prepared to defend. And we said, well, what you have done, they come up with all this assertion based on the survey they conducted with the information quality people and came up with the list and uh, published the paper. And they were the authority in the field. We were outsiders, so, so we were a little bit concerned that they are going to beat us. They accepted the paper and they invited us to make a presentation. We went there and talked about all the issues that uh, we found in their work. And most importantly, this non fictitious in auditing, we call it existence or validity, completely missing. I said, well, look, if I'm creating information and I'm selling information just to boost uh, my uh, co you know, uh, content of information, I can add a lot of fictitious uh, uh, information. And so, so how can you say that this information is uh, high quality if 50% is bogus? And they had to accept it. 
and it's still today, I mean, sometimes the information quality people, uh, you know, feel like uh, existence attribute uh, is not important, but it is, you know, if I'm selling information and create 50% fictitious information, of course, it's not high quality. Uh, you know, so, so on that basis, we thought, well, let's look at it. Here is a framework that was published in uh, International Journal of Accounting Information System in 2010, you can see, but it's still relevant. So we look at the whole process of audit, I mean, the creation of a document from uh, STML or ASCII uh, to XBRL document. So there are three different, uh, uh, you know, segments. One is the business facts in that XPR instant document. The fact that we are trying to translate, that is one aspect, and we have to make sure that that information is correct. Now, how we present it, that's the metadata in that XBRL document, that has to be correct. And then we refer to a lot of things, you know, uh, outside of that document. That is metadata external to that instant document. That has to be correct. But the question is, what does it mean when you say this is correct? So, it, so we try to put our thoughts and say, all right, now, if the business facts you have in the XBRL document, correct means what? That means we have translated every business information that we want to translate completely into the XBRL format. So that's completeness is necessary. Then existence means what? We should not allow anyone to create a fictitious in piece of information in the XBRL document if it is not in the original document. So existence in attribute is important for when you translate. And then the third one is accuracy. That means what? Well, accuracy means the number, the content, like if it is a $10 million, it should be $10 million. But the attribute has to be correct too, because 10 million is sold, but is it in Indian rupees or is it in US dollar in what unit? So it has to have the, the all the at, attributes uh, correctly. That means reference to the, the year, reference to the unit, reference to the accuracy, the decimal point, reference to the company, all those things should be there correctly. So, so, so these three major dimensions, completeness, existence, accuracy, but accuracy has two dimensions. One is the element accuracy. That means the tag we create for cash and cash equivalent, that number that it represents should be correct. If it is 10 million, that should be 10 million, not 20 million. And the other one is that it's associated attributes has to be there. So that is the framework in terms of thinking about the fact is correct. Now, next one is the how we present it, that's the metadata. So metadata is presented, one is the well-formedness, means the, <clears throat> the information follows the syntax of the XML. That means you have angle bracket, opening tag, closing bracket, and uh, you know, uh, a tag, and then all these different elements. You know. So it should be properly formed when we create the document. Any error, one missing uh, bracket is going to mess up the entire document and nobody can read it or the computer cannot process it. So, so the first element of that set of attributes is that it should be well formed in XML you know, schema te technology. The second one is valid schema. Valid schema means what? Well, you know, if I present uh, an element uh, like cash and cash equivalent, the schema that I should use is all its attributes should be there properly. You know, I cannot just say that opening bracket cash and cash equivalent and put the number and put the you know closing bracket uh, cash and cash equivalent. That is incorrect schema because it is missing all the uh, <clears throat> attributes. So it has to be properly all of them. That's the valid scheme. And then the third dimension is proper representation, means appropriate tag. So cash and cash equivalent should have cash and cash equivalent, whatever the tag is provided by the SEC or the standard, wherever you are. I cannot just put current asset or uh, you know uh, some other uh, account. I mean, it may be a tag that is in the taxonomy and has all these attributes except this is the wrong one. And so, so my XBL document is uh, just not correct. So these are the metadata related attributes that deals with XBR instant document, what we have right now presented. Then the third one is external 
external is means <clears throat> when we refer to outside uh, that should be correct too so there are four different attributes there so proper taxonomy proper taxonomy means am i using the one that is recommended for my business suppose i'm in a, in a banking industry and i'm preparing my xbrl document now am i using banking industry uh, taxonomy because sec has a, uh, taxonomy is specific to certain industries and so so as an auditor or as an accountant when i'm certifying this particular xbr incident document i have to make sure that this company has used the proper taxonomy so that is one first one has the relevant taxonomy means is the uh, elements tags and associated uh, schema they are using then Second one is valid taxonomy extension. <clears throat> that means what? Well, when, when we create, a, a, let's say, a new element, then it has to have the schema taxonomy proper. Uh, that means it has all the uh, reference to the, um, your uh, you know, context because they have to define, there's a, uh, you have to define its uh, different attributes uh, in the schema. So, so it has it has used the the valid XML schema to represent that extension. The 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 third element has to do with ex the element itself. You know that am I creating a new element with all its uh, schema, and that is the appropriate one because sometimes you create an element that already equivalent element is the taxonomy and so that is uh, inappropriate because nobody can relate to that you know because you are creating a new element and it has been a problem because a lot of companies because of the uh, short uh, as a time they create a new element but at the same time there is an element already in the taxonomy so that is uh, probably going to misrepresent and people will not understand that you are saying instead of using cash and cash equivalent you just say uh, cash in the bank and that uh, people will not be able to use it efficiently. And then of course, the proper link basis means the six link basis. Are you really defining the correct link base in, uh, you know, I refer to it and make it available. Some are the standard link basis that already there on the SEC side, but when you create a extension, you have to make sure that you refer to and give the correct link basis. So this is the whole structure of link assertions associated with providing certification or assurance or XPR document. Now, uh, the description is already there. I have already talked about it. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, gives a little bit more in terms of the examples. Uh, I don't need to go through that. Uh, <clears throat> now some issues. Uh, I have uh, now passed my time, but I will take only a few minutes here. Uh, there are some issues here. You know, if you have tagged information and users are using the tagged information, uh, you know, uh, there may be very a small amount, uh, some account uh, is uh, from materiality point of view, it is, it is maybe 1% uh, of that materiality, very, very small amount. But since it is tagged, I as a user will believe that, well, it is uh, audited information, XBRL uh, instant document is audited and this would be correct. But that does not necessarily mean it is correct because it may be, uh, you know, below the materiality threshold, and so the auditor may not have uh, checked it that thoroughly. So, so when we tag, when auditor provides assurance on the overall financial statement without this XBRL, they have a certain materiality limit. So, for a billion dollar company, few million dollars is nothing, and so that is immaterial. So they set up the materiality limit and conduct the audit. But when individual look at individual account, which is below the materiality threshold, I think the issue is here that is that really correct, uh, you know, uh, information may not be because auditor may have done some uh, review and then accepted it. Uh, okay, because it's just immaterial. So, so this is something is still an issue. How it is done, I don't know. It is a, it is a challenge that all right now at a individually small account level, uh, should we worry about auditing even that account? which is uh, below the maturity threshold, well, that's an issue because users are going to take 
and and use it as if this is a correct information and it is may not be correct and then audit process uh, well uh, the traditional approach for any you know audit is that you must look at the system that generates the information and test the controls and depend on the controls then you reduce your detailed testing well similar approach can be done here too because there are a lot of softwares being used to to you know create the xbl instant document so you can test and validate the xbl uh, software that creates the document and uh, uh, you can depend upon it but it's still <clears throat> uh, you have to test uh, uh, individual accounts uh, in a way to make sure that uh, uh, new extensions, new things that this system uh, software has not dealt with is uh, done properly. Uh, so the control test, uh, you can do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, but when you come down to substantive procedures, uh, the question is, uh, should you look at all items, a few items, and um, uh, whether you look at only the, the, the taxonomy, that is the extension taxonomy, the only the items that are unique, or should you look at it? And it's a question because uh, statistical sampling that we do normally in a audit, uh, statistical sampling makes sense when you have multiple transactions of similar nature and you take a, a random sample of 100 transactions out of 10,000 or 100,000 and take 200, conduct your audit and see that, yes, uh, you know, uh, the sample seems like has no error, so I can project it. And what is the probability of error being in the entire population? And so that is the sound procedure. But when you look at the XBRL tag documents and maybe 20 line items, and I have to make sure that each you know, line item has all associated tags and attributes and schema and everything, uh, it is not easy to think that since a computer software has been used to translate it, everything is fine. No because maybe there's a new element and uh, you know that uh, is not originally in the uh, software that will do so somebody has done it manually so these are some issues that uh, one has to think about when you conduct the audit but most importantly you have to <clears throat> really think another dimension is that textual analysis is becoming very popular and my friends here i think especially uh, mike willis uh, he's aware of it uh, they are involving in uh, sec uh, but textual analysis means reading the text and trying to infer uh, the quality of information published by companies, you know, because SEC requires that they must disclose all their risk related issues, means business risk in certain section called item 1A. Then the language itself is an interesting thing, you know, because if there are a lot of issues, maybe the management is going to hide it. So how they present it. So positive sentiments, negative sentiments, if there's a negative sentiments, do they spread all over the document to uh, really confuse the readers? Or do they put it right in the front and then have a big bang and then talk about uh, good things later on? So all kinds of things. So, so the one major weakness with this whole XBRL taxonomy, whether it's XBRL, uh, inline XBRL, <clears throat> you cannot perform textual analysis because of the reason that you cannot tag every way a word because that uh, becomes really inefficient. You know, you can't just uh, put everything in, uh, you know, into uh, taxonomy. I like, uh, uh, so I was involved in developing the system. I think I've told you, and this is now being used by top universities and University of Chicago, Yale and all that uh, to, to conduct this kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, analysis. And so even information, fetching information like uh, right now, let's say in the U.S., uh, every company is, uh, is supposed to have a, a financial expert in their audit committee or in a, in a board of uh, directors. If they don't have it, they have to disclose it. And so if they disclose it that we do not have financial expertise on our audit uh, committee, uh, well, of course, uh, you can't get it from uh, XBRL unless it is tagged. Same thing, you know, some companies are saying that we may never be profitable. Well, if they, you will never be profitable, uh, they, have, they have to disclose it and then you invest it on your own risk. You can't find that information because uh, it is uh, not tagged. But with this technology, so what I feel the future is that combination, that the AI is coming, artificial intelligence, search engines, and then uh, XBRL uh, taxonomy with uh, all this uh, inline XBRL. I think they all have to work together so that computer can process uh, much more efficiently. 
And so these are different risks that already have been developed, financial risk, legal risk, tax risk. So we have taken that particular <clears throat> terminology and incorporated in our tech, you know, uh, system. So now in a matter of seconds, you can get all these uh, sentiments, measures, risk sentiments uh, from our system for entire population from 94 to 2021. Yesterday data is available today. And then cosine measure is very interesting things. Cosine comes from <clears throat> uh, trigonometry, <clears throat> mathematics. And someone thought of this that each word is an axis. And so if uh, I have a, a document which is a multidimensional vector, and if the two documents are identical word by word, then the cosine measure of similarity is one because they are identical the angle between two, two vectors was zero. But if the two documents have nothing in common, not a single word, the D, these two vectors are orthogonal, angle between them is 90, so cosine of 90 is zero. So, the, and very interestingly, I just used this uh, one afternoon playing around. And so here is uh, Wipro and uh, Satcom. Satcom committed fraud and Wipro did not commit fraud. Look at that. Uh, the subsequent change in cosine measure of its own annual report, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, uh, not much change, but suck them, which is uh, committed a big fraud and the auditor couldn't find it. I'm uh, sorry to say that Pricewaterhouse was the auditor is a public information. They missed it and not only that, the PCOAB, the SEC wing of uh, uh, this, uh, who controls the auditor's behavior, public company accounting oversight board, they missed it too. And there is another paper that I published back because there's a deficiency and uh, that's what I do. I have published papers on fraud risk, audit risk and all kinds of things. They have a list of um, risky accounts and cash was not risky. So auditors and inspectors were not as critical about that uh, particular account. And they didn't perform a, a good job and chairman of uh, Satyam overestimated cash by $1.4 billion. This reminds me, it is similar to, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I should say it or not, but uh, uh, airport uh, security situations, you know, <laughs> homeland security. Uh, they follow only the uh, what the uh, you know terrorists are doing. If they take explosive in underwear, check everybody underwear. Do you think they will ever carry the uh, explosive underwear? Uh, if they carry uh, explosive in liquid form, check everybody liquid. Well, they will never do it again. And so I think we have to be a little more creative in terms of trying to see what could go wrong and then put the control over that. And now they change it. I think right now they take uh, 50, you know some. A random sample too, so the cash could be also part of it. Uh, here is another company. So it is, it is not something just a coincidence. Uh, Bank Corp also committed fraud in 2014. You can see that uh, uh, big change. You know? So as a physicist, I saw, oh, my goodness, this is really great. And I talk about it. So this is available from our system. You can do it in a matter of uh, seconds. Uh, so our system has 19 million SEC filings, 35 million documents, uh, because we parse different parts, it's daily updated. You can get financial, non-financial information and perform a lot of uh, uh, textual analysis. And I think uh, uh, to conclude, uh, for effective and efficient assurance process, experience and document, we need assurance, objectives, assertions as a set of criteria against which evidence could be gathered and evaluated and make a decision whether this uh, particular document that has been created uh, presents uh, represents fairly the document that we are translating. And conceptually, I think this is very important, irrespective of which country where you are, and you need to think about critically. And that is where I feel that you need to have in the committee some kind of a collaboration with academics. And in US, we have been doing it for a long time, and I'm sure both have benefited. It is not only the practice benefit, but academia also we benefit because by, by really looking at the real world problem, we are challenged in terms of our thought process that maybe we are on a wrong track, you know, practice is doing something else and we are doing something else. So it, collaboration is very, very important. And I will encourage uh, all the, uh, you know, uh, professional bodies in India to involve academics and, and have input and share your thoughts with them. And with that, I thank you very much and welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Rajan P. Sivastam, sir, for your enlightening, uh, comprehensive, effective, efficient presentation on the subject, sir. And I hope that participants would have 
take a lot. I'm receiving so many personal messages about uh, this presentation as well in line with other speakers who earlier presented. So thank you so much for making this presentation and enlightening all of us. Now let me thank take you. the opportunity also to uh, invite uh, Mr. Eric e. Cohen, co-founder XBRL and father of XBRL GL proprietor Cohen Computer Consulting to discuss and deliberate on the great reconciliar uh, the role mm. of XBRLGL. So I, I welcome and invite you, uh, Mr. Eric Cohen. Very much. And will you be sharing my slides or may I share my yeah, screen? Please? Surely, surely. So uh, my colleague, because to please run the slides of Mr. Cohen, please. All right, I see uh, where I've been right invited to share. Get our pictures out of the way, and we will begin. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to present. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to to be here with everyone, uh, to join uh, my longtime colleagues, uh, Mike Willis, who shared with you the latest coming out from the Security and Exchange Commission, the 10-year-plus uh, uh, filing histories that uh, have been happening there, the the change from the original XBRL format to the rollout over the last three years of the inline XBRL uh, with the uh, latest, uh, the three phases of the inline XBRL rollout beginning for the uh, fiscal periods ending on or after June 15th uh, that has just passed. So a big change in the, the US program the SEC providing, I uh, just announced today, the, the wonderful new data uh, at, at SEC and the APIs to get access. And I know we're all very excited with that large body of standardized structured data. Also to hear from my colleague Raj about assurance on XBRL. Uh, we have for many, many years been dealing with these issues uh, from uh, trying to figure out how the XBRL formatted information might fit within uh, today's auditing standards uh, with the European Single Electronic Format and the uh, CEAOB coming out with its requirements as companies begin to uh, submit their new, new filings and as assurance is uh, being required in many of the regions and as the issue of materiality, which Raj referenced, comes up. You saw the complexity of looking at these documents. Uh, again, some great tools out there to help you with that complexity. Uh, but Raj also said something very important, which is that the role of the XBRL today is to take an existing paper document and to turn it into XBRL to XBRL, XBRL -ize it. Uh, so with this wonderful uh, issue of the present of XBRL and inline XBRL and the, the different tools people are, are using today, uh, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna actually be taking us back 20 years. And I'm gonna be taking you back to a vision uh, of not a paper document coming out and then after the fact it's being turned into XBRL, but a vision where uh, the true power of XBRL is seen as uh, one SEC presenter said back uh, 15 years ago, that the true power of XBRL is when a report, a financial statement, a statutory report, uh, sustainability reports, which of course are coming in that uh, we didn't even talk about back then to the same extent, uh, when these reports are just a happy byproduct of internal environments made more effective with XBRL. With XBRL. And that in a large part is what XBRL GL has been all about. Uh, it has been about enabling companies, being a reconciler between uh, different parties within an organization, sharing information without different parties, getting information on the outside and being able to know that what they have is all interrelated and having comfort. Where instead of having to worry about looking at document after the fact, you can be examining the controls that bring you there. And you could be using tools like XBRL GL to be the means of making that all happen. So in our time together, I'm going to be talking about three things. Again, uh, if people didn't know that XBRL was more than financial statements, 
that XBRL is more than just a report, that the goal of XBRL is to improve data and processes and rules and to revolutionize the entire business reporting supply chain, uh, just to be that reminder. To speak about XBRL GL, the global ledger, and that how it's more than a general ledger data format. Uh, it's my pleasure to work with, with Vinod, uh, who, who spoke to you. Uh, we sit together on many committees, including the ISO TC295 Audit Data Group. And uh, TC295 came up with a, a specification for underlying detail. And there's a series of others that we'll discuss. And XBRL GL does that, standardizes that, was the foundation for that, and does much more. And finally, a little bit of a future picture, if you will. Uh, XBRL GL is the facilitator of future ready audit documentation. As we move into the blockchain era, as we move more into the continuous era, more content being reported in more ways, in more forms, far more frequently. How we as accountants and auditors are going to be ready for that and XBRL GL's role as the facilitator in that. So let me move ahead. Uh, as I say, when people think of XBRL, they probably first and foremost think about financial statements. And of course, that is for great reason. Uh, the SEC program uh, renowned around the world. Uh, Canadian Gap moving over to IFRS. IFRS uh, now being accepted by the SEC, but IFRS taxonomy being used for financial reporting in many, many areas around the world, of course, financial statements to the MCA. And so people's first thought is that this is about standardizing financial statements. It's about making the regulator's life easier. It's about making perhaps an investor's life easier, but it's never about the company. Uh, perhaps you have that broader view that XBRL is about reports and forms. Uh, HMRC and uh, their use of inline XBRL really started off uh, the inline XBRL movement. Uh, so tax reports, statutory reports, such as in banking and insurance utilities. And again, as we learn about the, the huge move now, as people are saying that we need to be reporting on sustainability. And so the ESG goals, sustainability, corporate responsibility, whatever you want to call it, the new movement, uh, the, the value reporting foundation, uh, and all of these different efforts to say, we need to get this information about the uh, will the company be here in 10 years? What are they doing in terms of the environment? What are they doing in terms of uh, showing their role as good citizens? And uh, the IWSB and IFAC and everybody getting involved in this and the United Nations saying that assurance is necessary uh, for this as it comes out. So again, XBRIL can be the amazing uh, facilitator and enabler of all of these things. But from its inception, XBRIL was meant to be much more than just a way to standardize forms and reports. Uh, from that beginning, it was what's necessary to streamline the flow of information from first entry, from working with a, uh, a trading partner, uh, from business activities within an organization, and everything that happens within the organization involving the internal accountants, operations, management accounting, internal auditing, preparing it for perhaps moving to the outside, uh, involving the external auditors, regulators, administrators. And so having a single flow from uh, first entry through to end report, including assurance and analytics and beyond. So it wasn't just about a report. It wasn't even just about data, uh, but it was about standardizing business rules, formulas, processes. If we're going to have be undergirding the, the world of audit. It's about audit documentation. It's about regulations being standardized. It's about the instructions. It's about research. It's about having a common way to represent information and to do all of these things to really change the way that uh, work begins. So if we go back the 22 years or so from the very first meeting of the then uh, XML-based financial reporting markup language group that turned into XBRL. At that first meeting in October 1999 in Chicago, the group came together and came out and said, our effort should have its roots in the audit supply chain. XFRML will be the technical standard for seamless process of exchange across all audit processes. Our opportunity, the thing that would set us apart, 
is to address things internationally and not just at a financial reporting level. We have US GAAP, we've got IFRS national GAAPs as well. But to come together for commonality at a level below the financial reporting level, since there's much more commonality at that level. So uh, again, this concept of the business reporting supply chain is where we began bringing a win, win, win to all of the parties that, that are uh, undergirding it. So yes, the investors, yes, the, uh, the security regulators or the tax administrators, but to bring the win, win, win for all types of reporting entities, the accounting profession, regulators, administrators, software providers, service providers. From the beginning, the goal was to uh, come up with a way to revolutionize what was happening here, both with the taxonomies that, that we hear about all the time, US GAAP, IFRS, the MCA taxonomy, for so many different purposes, financial reporting, standard business reporting, uh, governance, control, uh, EERG, uh, statistical, statutory. But then underneath this level, have a common way to represent the underlying details that come uh, from trade transactions, internal business events, from the event itself and all of its glorious detail, summarized on through, aggregated, mapping off to the financial reporting to have a seamless, transparent audit trail. So Xperial Global Ledger was designed to answer the call. <laughs> I, I've just been asked to to to, to speak in, in Hindi. Namaste, uh, I, I unfortunately, I cannot speak in Hindi. Uh, but Xperial's Global Ledger, it was meant to answer the call. Built on the framework of accounting software experience, uh, working with many, many different accounting software products as an accounting software practitioner. Uh, I felt that pain of data import, I felt the, the pain of my clients trying to move from one product to another. And I said, there has to be some way to make this work better. And so in 1990, a digital equipment company put a huge ad into all the major press saying that they had a new solution called NAS. And so in 1990, they said that they could make every software product work together as if it was written by the same developer. This idea that they were saying that you could have a general ledger product from one company and a accounts receivable pro product from another and an order entry from another and somehow they would click together like Lego blocks. I knew that wasn't true. And I said, what if there was a, a way and to bring together the accounting software developers with a common format to do that data exchange? So uh, I developed something I called it Add Fast Accounting Data and Financial Statement Transfer. Uh, I wanted to help people with that data integration and migration. I wanted to help people who had external payroll providers to bring, be able to bring in the data. People were using fixed asset packages that didn't work with their accounting. With the uh, beginning of the web, as people were starting to do web, uh, web sales, be able to bring that in. With all these non-integrated systems, how could we bring this into accounting software in a standardized way? So whether you were using products with names like Peachtree or Platinum or Real World or Maz90 or Macola, we could go from the lowest to the highest, from an older version to two versions later, and do this as efficiently as possible. And it was designed to simplify the work of external bookkeepers, accountants, tax people, and again, so accounting software could work like Lego blocks and just click to each other. With uh, the co contribution to the world of XBRL, we began to expand our scope from my very US focused mindset, working with people around the world, working with the United Nations, uh, the, the Center for the Facil Facilitation of Administration, Commerce and Trade, moving from a, a regional view to a global view that could bring all the regional thoughts to mind working on both internal information and that which is relevant to uh, stakeholders externally for operations and management, for tax, audit, statutory, statistical, financial, and being able to do much more to be able to be the foundation for pulling together the reports of tomorrow, the reporting needs of tomorrow, including qualitative and quantitative, including traditional accounting and ESG and any other reporting environment and to really fulfill that goal that sometime XBRO will have the greatest effect when reports are just a happy byproduct 
of internal environments made more efficient and effective with XBRL. There are other standards out there, and it has been my honor to work with them, to actually help lead some of them. Uh, UN CFACT has uh, accounting and auditing schemas and artifacts. I've worked with the OECD with their standard autofile for tax, and they have the SAFP. I've worked with just about everybody out there, but each one of them tends to have some very specific need. They tend to be region specific, uh, specific to the needs of Sweden, the SIE, specific the, to the needs of France, their audit file. And XBRL GL was made to be able to represent all of them. Some of them for a particular regulator, working with a particular kind of source system, working for financial audit or tax audit only, working for a specific, a specific form or report. And XBRL GL's goal was to be the great reconciler to be able to do any region and even cross regions and to understand how they interrelate, to look at book versus tax and why there might be difference like permanent and timing differences. So its goal was to span all these and again with the OIM and some other tools from uh, XBRL itself, working on not just uh, being XBRL as we know it, but being able to work in any kind of an environment. So it is the great reconciler uh, between types of gaps, between uh, different types of reporting needs from internal to external uh, for drill down summarization and the like. But uh, as uh, working with Vinod and others, we're talking about the need today for audit data standardization, uh, for being able to work with uh, people's data from external systems, especially as the pandemic has separated us from companies and direct access to them. With blockchain and distributed ledger technology, which without help is just going to take old legacy data and turn into new legacy data, trying to provide a standardization layer for the payload, trying to deal with decentralization and globalization, having a tool that will help us with the pandemic acceleration, while of course bringing us efficiencies today. So as this world of audit expands, uh, the SEC seeking its new input into climate change control, that, that recent announcement, uh, auditing ESG, auditing data integrity, auditing far more things, being able to have standardized fuel to feed into our AI tools, uh, being able to have structured data at the most uh, detailed level is something that makes this happen. And so we need uh, new ways to represent the existing information as well as ways to point to things that aren't in this format, to traditional paper that's still there, images, audio, and video that are increasingly be becoming part of an important audit function. So XBRL GL already has tools to help with this. XBRL GL is more than just a way to transfer data from an ERP to another. It's also how to explain information that you find in an ERP or other system. It's XBRL GL without XBRL GL with something called the XBRL GL data definition file. It's about rules and things to make sure that data in place, not in XBRL GL or XBRL GL meets certain needs with XBRL GL profiles. And it's about something called XBRL GL disk. And that's a way to be able to, again, automate links, point to data from any source, any format, any attribute, uh, no matter uh, if it's encrypted, no matter if it's uh, in some other form, uh, being able to, to show the pointers to that. And again, uh, many different efforts here. Uh, as I mentioned, Vinod and I are involved in ISO uh, TC295, from which the standard 21378 came out. But 21378 in large part is based on the ASCP audit data standards. That was originally based on XPRL GL. And we're also working in, within the United Nations to reconcile a number of these things to make it so that they will all work seamlessly, as seamlessly as possible together. But uh, again, as uh, Raj said, I know my time is counting down. Uh, XBRL GL is the great reconciler. It is there to fill the gaps, uniquely representing multiple methods of recording and talking about how they, they reconcile. Being the mappings from detail to aggregate, being the mappings from detail to where the detail source came from, helping with the vouching and tracing of auditing. It can serve as the glue explaining information in place rather than being the transfer format. It is extensible for local needs, a tool set for representing any information, qualitative or quantitative, that's necessarily part of a seamless audit trail. 
and again can define data in place even in non exprial formats. And of course, it's XBRL, and that means that we can leverage all the great tools of XBRL. Uh, right now, XBRL GL is uh, available already in a dozen different languages, the same XBRL GL underneath, but just with one little click, you can go from, in this case, US English into Italian or Japanese or French or Finnish or Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, and again, looking for for folks who might want to expand this for, for other languages important to them, all part of XBRL GL. So uh, moving to that, the audit of tomorrow, the ability of XBRL GL with the, the, the disk module to point to any data, to describe where it came from, how to transform it to get the detail that you need, whether it's encrypted, whether it's signed, how it maps to the information is uh, part of our development. And the goal here then is to be able to have a future ready audit documentation system. The goal is using XBRL uh, taxonomies to represent audit documentation and collect them. So it can be read in any language anywhere so that you can do your text analysis so that you can share it in a way that the predecessor and successor auditors or the regulator and the auditor or whoever needs to talk the the uh, the, the third party who, who you're sharing internal Everybody can have a better way to share audit documentation, to automate it, to move it between packages. And no matter where your internal, the evidence is coming from, whether it's in paper or some uh, database through an API or a blockchain, we can use DISC as the way to say this is where the data is coming from for our PBCs and the other information already within our work papers. We can do the conversions as well and have a standardized evidentiary repository using XBRL GL that can automate the, the process of getting the underlying data, all leading to a standardized trial balance using XBRL GL mappings, all leading to XBRL financial reporting, XBRL for ESG reporting, any kind of reports all from the same base. So uh, whether it is at the, the client level, whether it's at the auditor level, always being able to uh, have your reports and your external needs just come from internal in, uh, an internal environment made more effective with XBRL. So uh, again, uh, end of my time here, what is the broad goal? The goal is to make it so that someday a piece of business information once entered into any computer anywhere never needs to be retyped for an accountant to be able to look at any system in any language anywhere in the world and say, I don't know what this is, but across languages, data definitions, and file formats, using your XBRL GL color glasses, being able to look underneath and being able to query, understand, move the information in and out, and work with that system as if they all came from the, the same developer. Thank you for this time. I hope this was interesting for, for you. Always looking for people who uh, want to help live this dream and move it forward. And again, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eric Cohen for your wonderful presentation and uh, enlightening all the participants about the intricacies, implications of the subject and what is coming up, what is future ahead. So, uh, may, may I now request, may I request uh, to Ms. Liv Watson, uh, if she has joined. Anyways, so uh, I can't see Miss uh, Liv Watson, but uh, we'll connect back soon. May I now request Mr. Uh, Malab uh, Dalwadi, the founder and director uh, Micro Vista Technologies Private Limited, to address on the perspectives of XBRL India current scenario and future opportunities. And I think you come along uh, with different uh, you know thought process on the subject what actually india is uh, need to, needed to have in place so i welcome mr um, amala yes yeah mr amala so over to you mr amala yes yeah good evening everyone uh, just let me share my presentation
¿Sabes qué inis les digo el video, güey? ¿Qué más qué inis les digo? Yes, yes, Mr. Yeah. So good evening, everyone, and thank you, SOGM, for inviting me for giving this XBRL presentation. And today's uh, topic I am going to cover is XBRL India current scenario and future opportunities. So what I am going to speak on is, you know, journey of XBRL, uh, XBRL in India. Then I am going to more focus on the regulatory point of view. Uh, uh, you know, the regulators, MCA, RBI, and SAB, who has implemented the XBRL uh, in a bigger way, and the opportunities in India about the XBRL. So, the first question why XBRL was introduced in India? So, basically, you know, before 2005, uh, you know, if you want to file your annual report, it was completely manual. You have to go to your register and, uh, you know, submit your hard copies. So MCA in 2005 will come up with a uh, you know MCA 21 portal where you can uh, you know up, uh, upload your annual report in PDF format. So it becomes you know MCA claim it has become a paperless form, paperless format. But and uh, you know even though it was paperless, but the companies has to, companies are filing their annual report in PDF format with maybe a scan format or you know uh, uh, in a PDF format. Again, it is not a you know computer readable, not completely computer readable as it was in a scan report. So there was a need of a standard or a communication language, which, you know, if you can, uh, you know, anyone submit the data that has to be comparable, a standard format, globally acceptable and an open technology. Okay. So at the same time, you know, uh, the XBRL is this uh, having, you know, standard standard XML is a standard uh, for the communication of the bigger business language is an open technology. So this was the reason why XBRL was, you know, the best language to introduce uh, at that time in India. So just have a look at, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, just showing you what was, uh, you know, how the XBRL was introduced. The first, you know, the introduction was 2007 where BAC and NSCS started XBRL based platform, but it was not, uh, uh, you know, completed. So the first filing you can say that 2008 RBI started XBRL filing on capital adequacy report. It was they have started with the seven uh, XBRL formats, and 2009 then ICI has started a you know the XBRL India prediction in XBRL uh, uh, by XBRL International. Then 2011 MCA mandate XBRL filing. So if we talk about in Ministry of Corporate Affairs, the first filing was taken in 2011. And RBI started filing in 2008. Now, you know, XBRL in India. So, if we talk about XBRL in India, there are three regulators. One is Ministry of Corporate Affairs, where two statutory bodies, ICI and ICI CMA, so Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, handling the XBRL India. And ICI CMA means Institute of Cost Accountants of India. They are looking after the cost, uh, cost accounting and the cost auditing standard uh, and the managing the cost records and everything uh, and looking after the development in India. Then the body called Reserve Bank of India, they are looking after the corporate governance and governance of banking, uh, in, uh, banking in India. And the third one is a security exchange board of India. They are looking after the security exchange and listings uh, and everything about the stock exchanges and the listed companies. So under that, there are three major stock exchange called Bombay Stock Exchange, National Stock Exchange, Med and Metropolitan Stock Exchange. Now, if we talk about, you know, MCXBRL. So MCXBRL started from 2011. Basically, you know, there are two taxonomies. One is commercial industrial taxonomy and second is cost audit taxonomy. So there are basically, uh, you know, CA and I taxonomies called commercial and industrial taxonomy. So there are two taxonomies in C and I as well. One is based on accounting standard and second is based on Indian accounting standard. And second taxonomy is, you know, cost audit taxonomy. Those who are companies filing cost audit report, they file their cost audit under the using the cost audit taxonomy. Now, just have a look at the, you know, how, uh, you know, applicability of a commercial and industrial taxonomy. So the applicability would be, you know, if you are a listed company and having a subsidiary in India, then it is applicable to you and the company with more than 5 crore paid up capital and company with more than 100 crore capital. Those who are, you know, uh, are, are applicable, applicable and, and they are mandated to file their annual report in XBRL format. 
in the second phase you know the companies and their subsidiary associate joint venture to whom, whom in days is applicable they are covered under the xbrl for filing their annual report in xbrl format so who which companies are not covered the companies having non banking and uh, non banking and finance company banking companies and insurance company those companies are still out of you know annual report uh, uh, they are not mandated by the government for filing annual report in xbrl format now if we talk about the uh, you know mca there are another other taxonomy called cost audit taxonomy so if you look at the world where all the you know annual report file being filed so india being unique country where you know cost audit all xbrl is also there so here in india you know certain class of companies are filing cost audit report to the government so those are also mandated to file their report in the, under the you know xbrl and the using the cra code form by the government now i what i will show you i'll just show you the small demonstration what you know micro vista technology help companies and the firms to file their annual report in xbrl format and how uh, you know it will be helpful to the stakeholder to file the report in xbrl so there is a tool that we have developed this is called uh, xbrl uh, convert to xbrl tool which helps you to company to prepare in xbrl format here you can see on the left hand side uh your uh, left hand side all the schedules starting from profit and loss balance sheet and uh, and subsidies on the right hand side you can see the tax so we are providing uh, you know facility if you have excel file then you can directly import excel file you can tag those information you can copy paste the data that is another facility we are providing a search element like if you want to uh, search a particular element you can directly write and you can directly go to the particular element by clicking on that so you can you know easy navigation is also given in the software also there are validation tools uh, you know in built validation facility we have given because every schedule has got uh, you know a certain set of rules that has to be validated before generating xbrl file so like i am just giving an example if i uh, you know remove zero value here and i click validation validate it will highlight me error and i can also click and check this there is a mandatory field it should be greater than equal to zero so like this i can you know uh, validate the information before submitting to the uh, government so with this you know another facility we are providing is like uh, we we can also import the data uh, in a previously generated file by one click you can import a previously generated file and uh, you know your previous data previous year data would be automatically filled up and then you can just click on generate xml file and you gen you can generate the xbrl file and upload on the mca portal then once you generate the xbrl file then you just need to uh, you know just upload this xbrl file in your pdf format and upload on the government portal so what is the agenda was you know uh, with you know micro vista we being uh, you know technology company providing and enabling user to automate the process and is uh, help companies to ease their process for filing xbrl format so this software would help you for you know mca filing uh, specifically to uh, annual report cost audit report and also having the engine to capability of generating xbrl any taxonomy around the world now uh, you know the if i talk about the taxonomies and in india so you know first taxonomy was developed in 2010 11 it was a non dimensional taxonomy so it's a uh, you know non dimensional taxonomy it doesn't have any tables or hypercube or dimension you, there was a you know facility to you add the tuples and the rows and columns okay in 2012 the taxonomy was developed with the dimensional taxonomy and recently in 2017 18 uh, we have developed indian accounting standard taxonomy so that is a facility with the dimension and formula link base so we have we micro vista not only helping companies and the regulators for uh, filing the returns filing the xbrl files we also we are also uh, helping regulators to develop the taxonomy with, as per the international xbrl standards so uh, these are the you know indian accounting standard and as standard taxonomy being, being developed by uh, micro vista uh, with the taxonomy created to develop by us now what is way forward in xbrl in mca specifically mca you know today uh, mike and other speaker has already explained i xbrl in detail so i don't need to say what is xbrl is i xbrl is a xbrl with html so it's a human readable not 
uh, not only machine readable, it's human readable as well. So, uh, you know, uh, MCA, if you see phase three is already launched and the new website is getting updated. So in phase three, they've already included, they've already included the IEXBRL format. So going forward in a year or two, maybe you will get the IEXBRL format in for the annual report filing. Okay. Now, second thing is the way forward, if you see the data analysis. So around 30, 40,000 companies are covered under the XBRL filing in MCA. So one of the one of the key area that we need to work on every stakeholder is to work on how to use those data. So there is a lack of, you know, the software availability or, uh, you know, availability of the software and the data. So there are 40,000 companies data is available, 40,000 companies data available. You can one click, you know, is being XBRL document. You can uh, compare in a one of one click. So there is a market for the software vendors to generate, you know, prepare the data and do the analytics. Also, the regulators and uh, regulators are not using such data, XBRL data. If you see, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, regulators, even they are not using for, you know, comparing the data and also the analysis. Analysts are not using. So such requirement is there and this is the way forward that you can use the data for the data analytics. Your data is available uh, in XBRL format in a one click you can uh, compare the data. And the third point is, you know, the XBRL prepared, prepared is preparation. See, there are a lot of, you know, lack of quality filing is, uh, you know, is happening. Government at uh, the MC has already issued the you know, advisory to use the how to file your data, how to file your correct data. So I believe there is always a role for XBRL preparation, XBRL conversion. So still there is a requirement and going forward being IEXBRL is being converted, uh, IEXBRL being adopted and the new uh, standards and new uh, scope scope would be increasing. So the role of XBRL preparation would be, preparer would be increasing day by day. Now, uh, now I'm going to talk, uh, you know, talk about the XBRL as stock exchanges. So, you know, uh, XBRL 2007, the BSC and SEA started the, you know, XBRL, but it was not, uh, uh, you know, went through properly. So, 2015, again, BSC has voluntarily started XBRL filing with the one report called shareholding pattern. So, with the voluntary filing after getting success, of filing and response from the government or response from the listed companies, BSC has mandated, uh, mandated XBRL filing for all the listed compliances from 2016. So with this, you know, success of, uh, you know, XBRL filing and uh, uh, XBRL filing adopted by the listed companies, 2018 CBA's advises, uh, you know, all the stock exchange to use XBRL filing across all the stock exchange. So therefore, this leads, you know, uh, the stock exchange, namely NSC and MSCI, to use XBRL filing. So this helps, uh, you know, the listed companies to file only one report across all the stock exchange. Uh, earlier, there was a three different format for three different stock exchange for the same filing. Now they are using the XBRL filing for uh, across, uh, you know, for all three uh, exchanges. Now. Let's see what all uh, listing compliances are covered under, uh, you know, their stock exchanges. So there are financial result, shareholding patterns, annual report and other listing compliances. So total around 30 reports are being covered under the, uh, you know, stock exchange compliances in XBRL. And not only compliances, there are also inspection report like system audit report, internal audit report, cyber incidental report. Those are also covered under the XBRL reporting. Now, what who will be benefited and what what uh, you know uh, based of the because of the XBRL? See, to, before 2015 and uh, you know uh, BSC, NSC, all were you know accepting the you know their particular format uh, from the listed companies. And in, in India, around 4,000 listed company and uh, 2,500 companies are listed in the both stock exchange, namely BSC and NSC. So they were filing a PDF report and uh, the reports in the so and the, the stock exchange getting report in Excel format. So, see, for the same filing, company has to suffer. They have to, uh, you know, put effort to, uh, you know, filing, and uh, uh, you know, uh, so two different format, two different platform, two uh, same for the same filing. After XBRL being implemented, there was only one format accepted by, and the same format was XBRL. So the re reduction of time and effort has been done by the, uh, you know, because of the XBRL. And if you think about the 
regulatory angle. So today, Neera was talking about, you know, when XBRL they were started, there was only 3,000 filing for the first in 2015. Now, if you if you read the latest count, it is one lakh filing uh, in a year. So you, you can see how data is coming and what are, what are all frequencies, uh, you know, we, uh, stock exchange are getting the data. Okay. One is, you know, the benefit of the stock exchange is, you know, earlier the data was in PDF format. So they have got a, a backup staff who is making data entry. And then the data will submit uh, disseminate on the website. Now the data is coming in XBRL. So it's more accurate compared to the previous because it's a validated data. And within a fraction of second, they are uploading on a, uh, you know, their website. So fast and accurate analysis has been done in within a fraction of time as well. So if you see the opportunity in the you know stock exchange, so this was the you know scenario for us. Now we are talking about the opportunity. So opportunity, if you see the data, all the listed companies data. So if you want to you know check on like any a listing website or listing uh, stock exchange website, you go and check any company. You will find all the data available in XBRL format. So it is easy to compare. So data members, uh, vendors like Bloomberg, Morningstar, Reuters, they are heavily using this XBRL data for uh, doing the analysis. And as a consumer angle or stakeholder angle, you can also consume data easily because this XBRL file is easily available on the portal. And the third opportunity is software vendors. So software vendors for, for them, it is always opportunity to do in the market to create the API. So which help the vendors to create, you know, do the analytics. And, uh, you know, before that, I'll just show you the, you know, how uh, stock exchanges are uh, getting filed the data in, uh, you know, listed companies are preparing the data and uploading the uh, documents. So there is a one XBRL, you know, the software as I am showing you this Excel based template, which is given by the stock exchange to the listed company. So if I'm a listed company, I'll just download this file and prepare the data and punch the data. These has got file you know, facility to import the previous XML. So it is a quarterly financial result. You can import the previously import files. We'll have, you know, necessary company information. And then you can uh, import the data and upload, uh, you know, validate those information. And you can, uh, you know, click on the home button, validate all data, and then generate the XBRL report and upload on the Bombay Stock Exchange website or a National Stock Exchange website. Okay. So here, you know, MicroVista technologies involved in, uh, you know, enabling all three stock exchange, developing the taxonomy, helping tax, uh, you know, uh, list, uh, stock exchange to manage their portal. So uh, having uh, even, the, you know, within a 3000 companies to one lakh data in a fraction of data uh, seconds, data is being processed and disseminated on the website as well. And we are also helping to company uh, listed, uh, you know, stock exchange to develop the software in Excel template or, uh, you know, web-based form. So, uh, we, we being a you know, technical uh, technology company being helping the, you know, stock exchange to enabling that XBRL uh, technology, adopting the XBRL technology very fastly. And we being, uh, you know, the observer the, and the technology partner we have seen, the CB security boards in Board of India is completely aggressively using XBRL. The moment there is a notification, if there is a new returns, they are coming, uh, you know, they are blindly following the XBRL technology. So I believe that there is a next step. What they are thinking is IE XBRL reporting in a, in a near future. You will see stock exchanges are also consuming the IE XBRL. Now, one point I would like to make is XBRL CSV. So right now, if you know, stock exchanges are getting data in a for the listing compliances and the inspection file. So there is there is an area where you know the trading uh, trading data is also the. If you want to upload the data trading data in XBRL, so uh, there is only one way is to use the XBRL CSV because the trading data in a day would be uh, you know billions of data. So that would not be possible with the simple IXBRL or a small uh, you know pure XBRL file. Only XBRL CSV can be used to this uh, you know use. If you want to use then if you want to add up the uh, you know xbrl so there is also cb is also likely to use in the future for you know the consuming the data for heavy data they are going to use so tremendous opportunity in xbrl field around in the mca as well in the uh, security accent field now the third uh, regulator i'm going to talk about this rbi so rbi is you know long back you know 2000 they started this so in india the first adoption was of xbrl was given by the RBI. 
So they in the phase one, they have taken the seven report. Phase two in 2012, uh, they have come up with the 90 reports. Uh, and in phase three, in recently to the five years back, 2015, they have come up with the 95 report. The scope of RBI XBR is also day by day as increasing. But here the, you know, the challenge in IPR, RBI is completely different. So here, who is filing the XBR report is, you know, the banks, not the, you know, the end user. So banks are filing the reports. So there are under, you know, 200 reports are, has been prescribed by RBI. So those reports are, you know, uh, all banks as per part, there are, might be, there are, you know, certain reports are fortnightly report, there are monthly report, quarterly report and half yearly report. But those, uh, you know, reports for that XBRL generation tool is given the template base. So again, you know, uh, RBI is providing, uh, you know, one Excel based software where you download from RBI portal and uh, again, the, uh, fill in the data and then generate XBRL file. So imagine if you are, if you are a you know, big, big bank and you have fortnightly data, fortnightly reports, uh, 10 reports of fortnightly. So it is your job is become very tedious where you can punch the data every uh, every fortnight and then you generate and upload the XBRL. Second point is, you know, RBI is using the uh, XBRL, but you know, the XBRL is used for the analytics for the public at large. Here, the instant document, the XBRL documents are not publicly available. RBI is using for their consumption, not publicly. Uh, so you will not find, you know, any companies filing their balance sheet on uh, the RBI portal. You will not find those data. They are, these data are not available. So, you know, the role of data players would not be here. Data aggregators role not be here. So only RBI is uh, consuming this data for their uh, analytics. Now, what is the opportunity here? So opportunity is, you know, as as these RBI reports to award 200 reports are in template based, they are providing the software. And, uh, you know, uh, all these banks are using core banking software. So from that, you can, you know, as being a software vendor or any company, you can create an API and you can directly generate XBRL report and you can provide the facility to the core banking companies to generate the data in a XBRL format. Now, RBI is also come up with the automated data flow. So what they wanted, uh, any bank have a, should, must have a central repository for regulatory compliance. So you've got 200 branch or five, five branch or 10 branch. There has to be a central repository for regulatory compliance. So they want, uh, you know, RBI is mandating banks to use the ADF automated data flow format. They have given the format. So here the XBRL uh, reporting are 70% of reports are XBRL. So the, uh, you know, uh, the role of XBRL and opportunity is tremendous in also XBRL. They are, uh, RBI is also uh, consuming a large reports in, a, uh, in XBRL format. So these are the opportunities in XBRL. Now the last point I would like to cover is opportunities in India. So we have talked about the you know the MCA filing. We have talked. We have uh, I've spoken about the CAP filing specifically the stock exchange who is using BSE, NSE, and Metropolitan Stock Exchange. And the third one is RBI. Now what is you know what is in the pipeline? So there is an authority called Insurance Regulatory Development Authority. They are in a process of developing. XBRL reports in a year or two, you will get, you know, uh, about 400 reports are covering into the XBRL. Now, the near next reporting is come, uh, comes is already the business security and sustainable reporting. So, CBS recently issued a notification on that, and these reports are going to be there on uh, maybe uh, by MCA or CB, likely to be there uh, in XBRL report. And the future reports are ECB, ESG, and client climate disclosure. So, those I would suggest MCA. And the CB should, uh, you know, adopt this at uh, this reporting into the XBRL as well. And uh, MCA is also looking and is uh, planning to develop NBFC taxonomy as well. So for all this reporting, there is a role for taxonomy, uh, taxonomy vendors, software vendors, data preparers, and data aggregators. So the XBRL opportunity in India is tremendous and going uh, day by day by digital initiative, it is growing and growing. And we, MicroVista Technologies, being a software company and taxonomy developer and a software vendor, help regulate not only regulators, also the uh, you know software companies and the uh, data preparers to fulfill their XBRL requirement. So by this, I'm ending my uh, presentation. If you have any question, uh, I, uh, I, you can ask me. Thank you.
thank you thank you mr malap dalwadi uh, thank you so much uh, now i would like to request and invite uh, uh, ms liv watson senior advisor and uh, digitalization lead at impact management project and former senior director work visa work uh, workiva usa to please address on the xprl goes green risk and opportunities and present your views madam so i welcome and hand over to you madam thank Mr. you so much and again i wish we were all in india it's quite a little while since i've been there but uh, the progress in india is amazing with xprl so hopefully we get to come and see you again soon today i would like to speak to you about something that's dear to my heart and I've been talking about this for quite some time that we don't just need financial information to be able to make a um, good data driven decision in our investments and managing risks. So I'm going to talk a little bit what's going on in this space, because recently um, major efforts has been uh, taken to move sustainability reporting into the to the digital age. So please move to the next slide. I will give you a little bit a disclaimer first. Can I move the slide myself? There we go. This is just a disclaimer. For those of you who don't know IMP, the Impact Management Project is an unprecedented um, collaboration between all the sustainability standard setters, the regulators, the accounting standard setters and the funders in one room coming together to say we cannot develop taxonomies in silos. We cannot develop standards in silos. And the things that the colleague Eric Cohen said, data definitions and all of these alignments, we need to have a controlled vocabulary. So with that, because I represent so many stakeholders, I will say today I represent myself, but uh, giving you insight to what's going on at IMP. So please go to the next slide. Um, um, impact management funded, but we are supported by the G7. They uh, took an interest in this organization and it's a time bound project. We can quickly go to the next slide. It's a time bound project that is wrapping up at the um, next year where we have brought together all the key standard setters to build consensus. And it's been the most amazing experience because I joined after 10 years developing um, XPRL solutions and we grew very quickly to capture quite a large of the marketplace because of being the first to market by not just um, producing cloud solutions, I mean XPRL solution, but actually taking XPRL into the cloud to be able to have um, an environment that can um, manage multiple taxonomies, et cetera, in the cloud environment. But for IMP, we are looking now at multiple taxonomies. Right now we are at the junction where there are multiple standard setters. And I will talk a little bit about here, what needs to go green, what is happening, and what the role of IMP is in this picture and what you can expect coming. So with that, please go to the next slide. And what we are talking about is two key initiatives that we have done in the last couple of years at IMP. Number one, to bring all of the standard setters, some of us remember IFRS, it wasn't always an IFRS. There was jurisdictional standards all over the world. And while IFRS brought everybody together, the sustainability standard setters are just as fragmented. And so the first thing we, we announced last year is that the key stakeholders of the standard setters with the support from the World Economic Forum, we produce and 
papers that you know with regards to stating that collaboration was the way forward if you go into the it also stated that digitization should be part of that thought process. Now, if you look to the right, there is another major report we released because how do you apply all of these standards? And we know everybody is looking at climate disclosure today. So the same structure network came together and said, how do we apply all of these standards to actually meet a, um, a materiality reporting in annual reports? So these two initiatives had a sustainability standard toward harmonization as well as getting IFRS, IOSCO, and others to understand that even within the current environment, we can produce quality data for the marketplace. And you're going to see today that several of the standard setters are starting to bound together and form and consolidate. Please go to the next slide. So the big news after we produce the cons consensus between the standard setter on how to apply the TCFD, which is now starting to be embedded into regulations all over the world, including an initiative that I will talk to you a little bit here more in detail. But before I go on to um, to those details, let me talk about the impact of the IFRS Foundation. IFRS Foundation has quickly understood from pressure from many different areas that sustainability cannot be an afterthought and that sustainability carries risk. And with that, um, IFRS Foundation has made a public statement that they are creating this working group. Clara Barbie, the IMP team is managing that and Clara and I work very close together as she has done an amazing job bringing this consensus and then bringing me on board to bring a consensus to digitization. So we hope by the end of the year, we're going to have the same statement by the standard digital standard setters, as well as the standard setters that we have to collaborate. That isn't just XPRL for sustainability reporting today. There are many different dialogues and we need to drive everybody toward one data standard. We all know that. But as you can see on the right, what we are doing right now is building out that prototype that we showed that we recommended to the IFRS Foundation. And you can imagine by COP26, you're going to hear a lot more about that. Is this is what's going on right now? For the event, board, they have started the proprietary work under um, and, um, Jane, I mean Clara Barbie. So if we can go to the next, just the thought of getting the IFRS Foundation to think green has been a journey, but we are making huge progress. The next big event was when the G7 came out to support what is going on at the IFRS and IFRS Foundation to kind of drive this kind of um, consensus and the, giving us the support to continue our work. So when this endorsement came a few weeks ago, I have to say we all celebrated. If we may go to the next, please. What is the IMP doing today? Well, as I said, about a year ago, we brought together everybody to try to answering the question, why digitization? And there has been many dialogues now, and I will talk about a couple. As soon as I joined IMP, the structure network, which what we call this non-financial non standard setters, sustainability standard setters, um, there is kind of an agreement now that to stop calling it non-financial and calling it sustainability. But I was then appointed by IMP to the European Commission to work with FRAG to do proprietary work for what 
non-financial reporting standards will look like. And that report is now available in the public. That is your link to be able to establish a, a temporary working group that's going to hand over temporary standards by uh, 2022. And this work kicks off next week, so phase two also of FRAG. And for those of you who don't know who FRAG is, FRAG is equivalent to IFRS in Europe. They are not a standard. There are standard taker to them. They are a standard contribute feedback and then recommend it into EU legislation. The two parts that I want to say in the FRAG report before I go back to the IMP is the fact that, number one, in the phase one of this FRAG project, if you read that feedback um, that we gave to the Commission, two things happened, right? Number one, digitization was not something they were going to think of at the end. So, digitization is in fact for day one. And next Monday, we kick off nine working streams that are working under the FRAC to write these temporary standards before they even have time to create a standards board, which is a parallel process that is going on in the European Commission. I believe that they want sustainability embedded much broader and much quicker and all we can hope for that FRAG and IFRS will collaborate here so we don't end up with multiple standards but I am chairing the digitization work stream under FRAG and be working with many of my colleagues here within the XPRL community where we are actually going to be able to write the first legislation to standard to embed XPRL into sustainability disclosure. So let me now go back up to the non-financial digitization working group at IMP and some of the efforts that are going on there. First of all, we came together and wrote a TELUS report. What is a TELUS report? This TELUS report, by the way, will be submitted next week to our steering committee. But what is a TELUS report before we go on? It is um, a technical, economic, legal, operational, and scheduling assessment to see what a taxonomy registry would look like so that we could have interoperable taxonomies being produced to the marketplace that are not developed in silos, but really managed through a controlled vocabulary and controlled taxonomies within um, this ecosystem because sustainability is not something just ends up in, a in an annual report. And FRAG, going back to our recommendation there, that recommendation also says, no, sustainability is not an other report. It's gonna go into a structure management report inside the annual report. But the TELUS assessment, we did this technical assessment. We had over 70 people multiple backgrounds, but we didn't just bring XBRL into the discussion. We brought SDMX, OMX, EDM Council to say, everybody come together and collaborate. What does this ecosystem really need to be digitized? And that report should come out in the next couple of weeks. The second uh, phase that will start in July is that the members of the structure network are working to come up with a joint digitization strategy. And we are going to work very closely with the structure network, the regulators and others to call and the uh, information technology standard setters to come up with a joint digital strategy. I will be hoping to have participation from India as well. So this is a, an invite and I hope to communicate that because we need India at the table as well to be able to, to drive toward a joint digitization strategy. The next phase, we're also looking at developing a proof of concept, the case of knowledge graph. Eric Cohen knows this well, there's a company uh, and AICPA and Engine B who's building the kind of knowledge graphs that drives 
audit tax and legal, and we need these kind of knowledge graphs to also sit behind um, uh, assurance for sustainability as well as standards and financial standards. So that is the three projects that you see here on the top that I am leading at IMP today, as well as working with FRAG now with the opportunity between now and Q1 or 2022, they will have a technical strategy and we must work together. So this is consensus from around the world. With that, if we may go to the next slide. So, why are we doing this? Number one, cost of compliance. I came out and said the cost of different data definition, different technologies, the official industry sector alone spends $780 billion on compliance. That is amazing. Now, they are very supportive also, as you can see, on IFRS becoming a global standard setter, and I couldn't agree more. We don't need multiple standard setters, but because the world is moving at different level, Europe, I see moving much quicker then, for example, first foundation be able to bring consensus. So at some point there will be more consensus. Any growing company, if you start looking at all of the standards that is available for free, there are thousands of standards and framework in this space, all with good intention, but we all need to remember that even good attention can have, um, unless coordinated, can have a major impact on the cost of compliance. And then you, on your right, the regulatory requirement, sustainability has been nice to have or asked for by investors and other stakeholders, but the sustainability is now moving into the regulatory regime. And as you can see from the recommendation then that the European came, Commission came out with a few weeks ago, which was the, um, um, the kind of role that I had within uh, representing IMP and chairing the FRAG committee that got digitization to be part of that recommendation. So for those of you interested, both from a regulatory standpoint or more from a preparer standpoint, pick up this report because this is the draft directive for the new regulatory um, regime that will be coming under the European Commission, who wants to obviously be a world leader in driving sustainable economies. Please go to the next slide. I'm going to be quick behind as well. If we go to the next slide. So, what does it mean that XBRL goes green? Well, welcome to the reporting exchange. Exchange. If you have never visited the reporting exchange, it's a UN initiative. They have aggregated all the reporting provisions that are out there for sustainability, 2,000 plus, and they are growing. In fact, we did the research at FRAG last year, and they've been growing in 10 years to 300% of new reporting provisions. There are about 1,424 indicators. There are 1,107 organizations trying to set standards or principles. And then you've got 652 rating, ranking, and indexes that looks at sustainability. This is an alphabet soup that, what, where do you start? What is going, going green? So please go to the next slide when you understand this ecosystem and you understand the passion behind this, it is um, consolidation is going to take some time. This is the European report that um, we just finished to the, give to the European, Rec uh, European Commission for recommendation to develop sustainability standards. And that is what we are kicking off on Monday is the first meeting we are about 70 people 
from uh, public and private and, and, and different area that are coming together to write this. And when you start looking at the uniqueness of what we came up with during this process that took seven months, we even sat on, I never seen this, the night before Christmas, the European Commission document, out. that's how important it was to them. But if you look at this, one thing that I want to, um, you to, uh, you can read this, but there's one thing I want you to look at and take home. It's bullet ESG is kind of the topical of, of sustainability disclosure. But when you start looking at the European Commission, they're going to call it ESG plus because governance, um, intellectual property, all of these other things are going to come under what we, <laughs> We kind of came up with ESG plus. It's any more government to be broader and grow broader than it was defined before. And there is also a significant effort in Europe to wanting to drive toward international standards, but Europe sees themselves as a leader in the green economy and driving sustainability finance as well as not just a disclosure mechanism, but change the way you're thinking of economic development on sustainability being at the heart. Please go to the next slide. So what are we going to look at when it comes to going green with the European Commission. Between now and the Q1, we're going to write a sex sector agnostic standard that will have XPRL embedded in it at the beginning, not at the end. We're not going to develop the standard and then come in at the end to think XP, uh, XPRL will obviously be the standard that is no thinking about financial recording, XPRL is embedded in many parts around the world. There is no reason to have multiple standards, but sector agnostic standards, and we are to deliver them by Q3. And then eventually by then there should be a standards board being developed on the F frag during that time. They also have to change their governance model because they've always been a standard taker and not a standard shedder. Now, we, I am the big proponent of one global standard, but I also understand certain economies move quicker. But I think what this collaboration will look like, and I think you're going to see some very positive outcomes being announced at 26. Hopefully, we can all get over the virus and come together again. This should give you how we think about the standards and you know digitization and XPRL is very core part of that. Please. So I can't move the slide here, I sorry, but uh, if somebody can move the slides, please. Thank you. One of the key thing I want to come and talk about here is that we talked about structure network coming together to um, to uh, build consensus. And one of the key things that happened on June 9th is that SASP and integrated reporting do no longer exist. They came together under the value foundation to be able to create frameworks and standard that can support information producers and information users and regulators can start developing uh, standards on structured and controlled vocabulary. So this is the vision for Value Reporting Foundation um, is to bring this consensus and this was built under our um, work at IMP to bring this consensus and uh, the Value Foundation now is officially there with a new governance and a new board. The 
use this standard and the IFRS framework, but hopefully more and more will consolidate under the value reporting foundation. Next slide, please. To get the value foundation off the ground, we need money. And there is a huge amount of interest within the fund who has funded silo projects for sustainability. Now they will only fund projects that will help consolidate and help drive consensus. So Tipping Point Fund came out and, and uh, it's a kind of a feeder fund. So many organizations contribute funding for there and we were able to raise $500,000 to be able to get uh, the value foundation out the door and have the resources to be able to develop into an organization. Tipping Point is also funding many projects and not that I can talk about them now, but by the end of the month, you will hear a lot more from Tipping Fund funding projects to harmonize and digitize. Next slide, please. So what do we need though? We need, I, um, as I said, developing audit knowledge graph, tax knowledge graph, legal uh, knowledge graphs. And that is kind of the digital brain or the clone of the ecosystem for um, the certain domain, but we are lacking sustainability reporting knowledge graphs that can support taxonomies and also make them into public good that can be used in the marketplace. So a um, lot of discussion are going on with many key stakeholders here right now. How can we have interoperable knowledge graphs to support the digital ecosystem and disseminate to the marketplace so it can be bended into solution and digitize and think about it if we have that digital consensus also agreed on wow we are gonna we are finally gonna digitize not just the uh, tagging information but hopefully have the, the the digital brain to support it next slide please Now, this, there are some extra slides there on the end for some additional information for you, but I want to emphasize to you, sustainability is not just driven to big company that has to report in the European sense. They want to embed everybody into the economy so that there are kind of pre-material things that are aggregated of interest will uh, be mandated. So when you saw also the, um, the report and the directive from the European Commission, it's very clear that the SMEs are gonna be embedded into the regulatory regime and disclose sustainability publicly and that standards will be developed for them in Europe over the next year, uh, over the next five years. But, what is also key with the European Commission is that they came up with the EU taxonomy. And for those who haven't looked at that, you should really take a look. It's not an XPRL taxonomy. It's a taxonomy for activities, but it will be obviously later turned into a digital model of XPRL that can be reported to, I hope. But it is channeling money towards sustainability activity, which means that every bank, anybody who takes assets, or investment has to ensure and measure that is it is it uh, um, a, a green investment that has positive impact and are you really toward a what we call stranded assets when are you moving away from assets some of you might have seen what happened at exxon at the last board meeting where sustainability uh, came together and forced Exxon to accept board members that wanted sustainability at strategy because oil eventually will be a stranded, like coal, a stranded asset. So this here is going global and a lot of activity is going on there. So it isn't just disclosure, it's actually driving different economies. 
questions. And with that, I am going to hope everybody will be able to share with everybody because there are links in there to everything in there. A passion of mine, this topic. So I'm going to turn it back. Because I could talk for our thing for everything to come here and should you um, the sustainability going great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee Watson, for wonderful presentation, enlightenment on the subject, deep inside the subject indeed. Thank you so much. So um, I have a few couple of questions from uh, different participants. So I will invite Professor uh, Bhavna Chhabra, she comes from uh, HI Business School, uh, Gurgaon, India. Uh, she wished to raise a few questions. So may I invite uh, Dr. Bhavna Chhabra, please? Thank you so much, sir, for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to ask questions. First of all, before I ask question, I would first like to congratulate S. Sham for uh, you know organizing this international conference uh, with such good deliberations on a very contemporary topic. And uh, I was listening to all the presentations very carefully. Thank you so very much once again, sir, for giving me, sending me the invite. And uh, my question is like, you know, it took long for, uh, you know, even the Indian companies to, uh, you know, get converged with IFRS, even uh, not, not till date our banking and insurance companies are, you know, fully converged with IFRS. So what do you think that how long, uh, you know, uh, will India take uh, to get converged with uh, XBRL? And this question is open to any of you, any, anybody can take this question. Okay, so uh, if you want um, me to be this specific, is it, how long will it take? Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry. No, I said, how long will it take for conversion? You know, I'm going to tell you when Eric Cohen and Mike Willis and I in the early days and Rob. Here too, obviously. When we wrote the first business, some of you might remember, it wasn't always called the XBRL. XFRML was the first relation of XPRL. And it was during the dot com area. And it actually said that within one year, um, regulators will adopt this because XPRL is better than sliced bread. Who doesn't want digital information? <laughs> and of course, we have learned the hard way that many, many years later that. Uh, that uh, it's a people process. We have to bring consensus. We have to get so softwares to embed this technology into their solution because nobody's going to pick up a specification and start using it. So it took a long time to bring everybody to the table. And I know Eric Cohen, I mean, Raj, how many <laughs> first time I came to India was with Raj? How many years ago? Two thousand one. Five years ago. Yeah, 21, 20 years exactly. March two thousand one. <laughs> yeah, Raj took to me India. to India, <laughs> and we thought India would really see this twenty one years ago because you always tech savvy. You always, you know thinking and always willing is just part of your culture, right? And look at it, 21 years <laughs> later, Raj, when are you going to invite me back? <laughs> well, let us see. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it. it uh, even there, you see, we introduced to the educators, Delhi University, and then the chartered accountants were there too, I think from Institute of Chartered Accountants. But uh, it took so long for them yeah. to really even realize, you know, the value, so things go slow, you know, a lot of uh, uh, hurdles. So hope that administrators in India realize yeah. the value and, uh, you know, go for it. Because, yeah. Thank you. Thank and you so much. For You've done a amazing job moving us forward in the end year. So I wanted to do an amazing, consistent, persistent getting the message out there, Vinod. So thank you. 
thank you so much uh, in fact i have another question uh, for uh, dr rajin p srivastava sir maybe joined also by with uh, ms lee watson and by the way i lost the connection in between i am not very much sure whether dr chhabra has raised this question to you earlier or not the question comes in context of uh, uh, you know that uh, uh esg for non financial esg information is to be discoverable and meaningful so any stakeholder can find and depend on it do you think that digitization based on taxonomy is defined and agreed by standard setters is the way forward well, um uh, i think maybe uh, liv can give her uh, version then i can tell some or uh, how you want to go i can go first and you can add but uh, i think definitely making a standard and some taxonomy helps the distribution of information more efficient but sometimes the language itself can play a very important role in terms of how the companies or management portrays that information and so textual analysis and artificial intelligence and uh, text mining tools and these become equally important we cannot just solely depend on this tagged information because tagged is what you need to tag but if it is not tagged you can't get it and so how i communicate is so important and already the research is showing right now the current trend in us and western world is even in india is coming now textual analysis and lot of sentiments and all those kind of analysis is not just possible you cannot tag every word irrespective of whether it is a business information or uh, information related to sustainability you know you have to integrate both sides so i feel like you know having just tagged information is not adequate yes of course if you have everything it objectively depends on these facts you can do that but lot of times the facts can be distorted the way you communicate so it is very important to have tools to analyze the language and that is where the textual analysis and artificial intelligence will be important so liv you have any comments to add looks like we lost her is she okay well i think there is network issue at uh, ms watson side yeah um so uh, before i go for the final uh, you know vote of thanks and concluding remarks may, would request ca binod kashyap sir he is there he has conceptualized the whole entire program convene uh, for this whole conference so may i request uh, ca binod kashyap sir for your quick uh, you know closing comments Yes, you are yes, audible, yes. sir. Perfectly. At the outset, I would like to congratulate SOKM first of all to take this initiative to organize a conference for dissemination of latest development on XBR. What is happening around? As I have shared, the last conference of XBR which happened in India was in the year 2016. Lot of water has flown under the you know under the bridge last four years. so it will be good if it asos camp continues its effort in organizing this kind of conferences every year and then you know second is i would like to say a big thank you to all our international speakers who have been kind enough to spare valuable time get up early in the morning and then share thoughts on this subject with us thank you so much to you to shivasawa mike Dr. Watson, Eric, they all have shared wonderful thoughts and given us a lot of, you know, a lot of food for thought and you know to think uh, and take XBR forward in India. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, C. A. Benut Kashyap sir, for your closing uh, remarks. And uh, for officially from side of the association, I am thankful to each one of the international national speakers to present your perspectives, sharing your insights. uh thoughts uh, for this uh, in this conference and uh, we are truly uh, privileged to have your kind you know enlightenment for this conference all the participants they are uh, responding to us and look forward for many more such 
uh, you know association uh, in our upcoming event programs uh, we will definitely uh, look forward to invite you and uh, let me uh, let me also give the thanks to all uh, present over here the participants and the sponsors partners tci express tcil renew power smart bharat group bombay stock exchange investor protection fund babtel uh, partner from uh, microvista smc global securities my entire team who has uh, done a lot of work mr vikas bardwan uh, mr jatin kochar all the participants including you deserve kudos for the successful of this conference um, and thank you so much look forward to your I think Mr. Parashar has lost his connection. So, and last, we would like to thank each one of you. If there is any suggestion, any feedback, any query, you can write an email to Mr. Santosh Parashar on the given. With this, we will close the uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rajendra sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Vikas, for making it. I, I lost the connection in between. Thank, Thank you sir. so much. Right. I Thank hope you, this uh, this is closed now. So please announce. Yes, sir. The program is closed, and I have already announced. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, sir. So I am closing the program now.